Welcome everyone to today's episode of Profound States. Uh, I have a special guest tonight, or we have a special guest tonight, Jeff Selver. He is an abductee who has lots of experience with the Greys, and I will read as much as I can of his bio just to get started. Uh, he has an MBA, uh, but didn't think of himself as a UFO guy, was a financial advisor for a bank and worked in sales. Um, uh, yet a bizarre, un unexplainable traumatic event which occurred to him in his young adult years came back to haunt him. When he began investing in its cause, the same lights in the sky associated with the bizarre event from his past appeared just as they did 20 years prior. At this point, he knew the experience was associated with an otherworldly presence. Suddenly, at the age of 41, screen memories came to light and broken memories of unbelievable alien contact events began opening up. He would then learn the details of this traumatic event that happened as a young adult matched what is now understood as a genetic activation. Understanding its origins opened a lifetime of obscured memories of alien contact. He then provided, and then he, he then proved to himself that his memories were real by having knowledge about places in nature he had never been and corroboration, which continues to this day, of unique similarities between his contact events and so many other contactees. Some details too specific to have been made up by his mind. He then began piecing together his story and his, and his involvement with gray aliens. Armed with the unique ability to recall his obscured memories in detail, in part, uh, facilitated by the genetic activation, passing a lie detector test and videos of UFOs flying outside his apartment while he wrote his book, which can be seen on his website, www.jeffselver.com. That's two Fs, J-E-F-F, www.jeffselver.com. Uh, Jeff tells his story. In December of 97, Jeff experienced the rising, which was in agreement with the gray aliens to discover his soul. It was an intense consciousness-raising event Coupled with the genetic activation, the rising required him to take a leap of faith, sell all his possessions, and begin a life traveling from place to place. What unfolds is truly an epic adventure of removal from society, from society, chance meetings with people, and living close to nature, all while having contact events with gray aliens without his knowing. This is the intro, this is the intro into the wild. The alien contact version, complete with paranormal events, encounters with strange objects in the sky, and with beings from beyond. In summary, it is 26 contact events with gray aliens told in amazing detail and spread out from the years 93 to 2017. And his book, The Rising, uh, subtitle is The Alien Plan to Build an Enlightened City on Planet Earth. Welcome to my show, Jeff Silver. Uh, hey. That, that that was that was a, a bit of a long intro. Uh, it wasn't bad. It's well written. You did a good job. <laughs> um, I didn't know that was the bio you were thinking of. So that's the that's the kind of the book page actually. So that's good. Uh, cause the bio is just a bit about me being an MBA guy and all that stuff. So that's good. <laughs> well, I didn't know you were going to read that. Uh, yeah. I guess the very first question I would have is yeah. Um, how far does your memory go back in your life to the what what age do you think you were conscious of your life age usually it's uh at the age of like four five or six when people begin learning uh begin they can recall back to their conscious first conscious memories in life i remember like maybe one thing when i was like four um ish. Oh, interesting now, um, what, what what age did you do you start remembering your life at um, so, uh, we moved, uh, from, I was born in Prince Rupert, BC. We moved to Burlington and I have a memory of the place for a couple weeks as we moved. I was a year old and I have a memory of a year. That's impressive. Yeah, I have a memory of, of the, of the place we lived in, in, in between that, the two houses that like we lived in like a, a townhouse or something like, or we rented out a townhouse in Burlington and, uh, and I had a memory of that. And my mom was a bit surprised. I, I was like seven or something or six and said, didn't we stay there at some point? And my mom was surprised. I had that memory. Yeah. So, was so a, that say, was a year old. When you say Burlington, you mean Burlington, Vermont or Burlington? No, no. Uh, everything, everything's the Canadian version. Uh, Burlington, Ontario, Vancouver, uh, yeah, BC. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Burlington, Ontario. Yeah. So uh, okay. just outside Toronto. So 
we know when you start remembering your life was very early compared to most people. When, when, when was the first thing that you remember of any kind that's unusual in any way, shape, or form? Doesn't have to be aliens. Anything strange? Yeah, unusual. anything strange, eh? Um, so it's really hard, right, like to kind of pinpoint that because there were – only now, when I unravel the alien content, do I realize, oh, some of these things that happened were actually a bit bizarre. Um, but they weren't that bizarre growing up. Uh, I had some kind of past life awareness, actually, as a child. And um, and that was a whole interaction I had with my mom and stuff. And uh, it was the last life I had. And so that wasn't that normal to do me. Tell to us. Do, do tell us. Yeah. Um, so I was in the Holocaust. I was uh, I was a, a Jew in the Holocaust and died in the concentration camp, and uh, I had. Uh, hold on, hold on for a second. So yeah, sure. <clears throat> when, how how detailed do you remember that? I mean, do you remember actually the death experience in the chamber? The Everything? death, yeah, yeah. Okay, so good good question. So, um, uh. Let's say so. There's a um, you know I'm actually studying uh, the CIA's documents on uh, on remote viewing right now, and 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 their method is actually the exact same method I I use getting these memories out. It's uh, get bits. They call them bits. So when you have pieces of the of the flashes and and those pieces, very very long time ago, probably decades ago, I confirmed for myself those de those bits were real because they would contain information that I didn't have uh, that was very historical. Uh, so an example of that is I know that when he died, that guy, I'll say him, not me, uh, when he died, he was in the concentration camp and he was grasping for air. Well, they had an asphyxiant gas that was, it's called, uh, the, the type of gas they use is called asphyxiant and it choked you to death. So, and then as a baby or as a child, I was having dreams that I couldn't grab air. Um, and it would be versions of it. It would be underwater. It would be in a cave. It'd be something I couldn't, I couldn't escape. Uh, my mom, when we were watching a World War II uh, when I was a child, we were watching a World War II, uh, I don't know, documentary or docudrama, and my mom just said the most randomest thing to me. And she said, oh, if you had been alive, because I, I still have Jewish blood now. She said, if you had been alive then, you'd have been taken. And I said, I got up and I had this like, I don't want to be Jewish. I don't want to be Jewish. And of course, like, I, I'm not anti-Semitic. I, you know, I had the memory of that and, and, and the, and they really humiliated you. Right. And, uh, and I was screaming it. And my mom was like, what's going on with this kid? And uh, she eventually told friends about it. I remember her being at a party and she's like, yeah, and you just kind of randomly started yelling. I, I, I don't want to be Jewish. I don't want to be Jewish. And uh, that was just really weird. Those are, those things were just weird for me. I didn't understand them or think anything larger about it. Uh, it took me years to understand that there was this larger picture. Um, now, over over decades of having those memories come out, those bits, I have quite a bit. Of, I can tell you the story of that guy. Yeah. So I have quite a bit of detail. I know um, how old he was. I know where where it all happened. Uh, in, it was in um, Poland. In there was a mountain range in the south of Poland. I, well, I get go ahead. So, yeah, go ahead. I'm not so much interested in all the details, but yeah. uh, in general. But however, what I what I and the audience are probably very interested in is when you recalled it, uh, A, what exactly was your technique, but even more important uh, or equally important, um, how did you re-experience the memories of the death and, and anything else you remember? Were you like, okay, were you re-experiencing as if you were there with all the details, you know, as in first person? Yeah. Were you seeing it as if you were there looking as if you were a spirit outside his body watching him die or all the above or more? What uh, A, what was the technique you used and B, how did you experience it when you? Yeah. Um, so there is like the technique is uh, just getting the mind out of the way. So um, uh, there was no technique. I didn't I didn't I never, ever sat down and said, I'm going to get these memories out. Um, that never occurred. Not with this life. I've done it now with, with a different past life, but uh, this life I've never done that with. And it just is, you know, going, it's, uh, there, there are moments of getting the mind out of the way. So, uh, you know, going to sleep, I meditate quite a bit actually. So I, I might be drifting off to sleep and then there's a, a kind of a, uh, 
a moment of connection to that 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 moment, uh, that life. Um, so, uh, so you pick, so you're saying that you picked it up in a hypnagogic or hypnopompic state. Uh, sure, I don't know those words, but I, that sounds. That's like those something. states that are. They, that's what they call the states between awake and asleep. Yeah, yeah, that uh, through meditation. Also, um, I've learned to do it now while, you know, doing a, like walking or something where my mind is put in one state and then I can and then I'm in kind of a, I can activate or, you know, grab that subconscious space. So, yeah, and that's over, let's say, decades, decades of that. So then I'm, I'm grabbing those pieces. So um, you, you were trying to get it for a long time and you finally got it is what you're saying no i never tried you tried <laughs> there's you just, no trying it was just something you were able to do when you chose to do it, it well and so different. the the larger pieces you know you're always self-exploring right so you're always thinking uh because i can feel it i could feel the link that my some of my emotions and my tendency my mental tendencies uh, were born in a, in a different time. And so you're always like, why am I driven for that? Or why am I thinking that way? And then uh, over decades, you're pulling out uh, some of the some of the traumas, actually, because uh, that guy got very, very traumatized. And uh, so uh, in, in many ways, it forms it formed and shaped the life that I have now. And I'm the one driving out of curiosity uh, where some of these things are coming from. And so it's really just self exploration. So does uh, a long time ago i had uh somebody bring up um some stuff about some injustice and i don't remember what it was but um i do remember that um they were just they were asking me they were asking the group i was in um how do you feel about this and, you know, most of the people in the group said, uh, you know, I hate it or whatever. You know, they had emotions with it. And I, and when, when she came to ask me, I said, well, it's not that big of a deal. It's the past. You let it go. It has no control over you if you let it go. But if you still have emotions over it, there's still something there you need to resolve. Right. So I guess the... The most obvious question for you along those lines, having, um, you know, prerequisite, put a little prerequisite before your question, do you still hold uh, any uh, emotions over uh, what Hitler did? You know, not, I'm not talking about in general, but just specifically you in reference to having been killed in that way or, you know. <laughs> You know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, very much. Um, no, it's not. Uh, it's. Hmm, it's a great question. And there's I, 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 there's a larger picture going on here, which is you can't hold I can't hold a resentment uh, about anything that anybody ever did in, in uh, for uh, that affected me personally in a past life, because what I've learned is that. I've either been the vice versa as well too. So in other lives, I've been the oppressor. So you're kind of like you can't, you can't, uh, you can't hold on the, those kind of ways. Um, okay. What? What? Okay. Okay. But let so, me let me finish one sec. Just the point ahead, of that, go ahead, go ahead. because it's it's well, it's important to resolve the point that. Um, but let's say things that affected his identity that were very personal to him, like subconscious alterations, were the things that that lingered. So. Uh, so, for example, um, I'll just to maybe make it a bit personal here. Um, his self identity got, uh, you know, they tried to humiliate, right? Like for, like in the concentration camps, they tried to humiliate uh, the the prisoners, and he embodied that humiliation because uh, he was, you know, he his whole entire everyone got killed, everyone he knew was basically dead, and then his families and everything, his future is all wiped out. And so, but the thing that internalizes for him is the is the is the self values thing that goes on, and when those memories come out, I'm not holding on to any of the external content. I'm feeling that that loss that he feels, and I'm like, oh. And then as I resolve that loss, I'm 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 taking it to the larger perspective. I'm like, oh, if he just understood, like you know, life goes on, and but he was so attached, and he was so wanting, you know, he loved his family and loved the loved ones, and. And of course, none of that has anything to do with. I don't think about Nazis or Jew or or any of it. I have no 
the whole premise that created those emotions really is just it's kind of it's not part of my mind. It's what's part of the mind is is the emotion of just the the self inflicted thoughts uh, that lingered, and I have to heal those. So uh, does that answer that question? Well, it does, and it actually answers more than that question. It gives me an understanding that you have um, pulled up. It seems like you've pulled up a lot of details about that life, not just you know snippets. How much? How much of that life do you really recall? It sounds like you recall a lot of it. Quite a bit. Yeah, quite a bit. I I mean, I couldn't tell you what his favorite food is or something, but I know, I'm pretty certain I know where he lived. I'm pretty certain, uh, yeah, the, the path, the, the, the trail of his life, let's put it that way. I could probably label it out exactly what occurred. And I know what some of his feelings and thoughts were uh, during certain periods of, the, of that life and sometimes yeah like I, there's different ways i describe this i get what's called um by the way this is all facilitated by the aliens right i saw my past life on an alien craft so uh for me this is all kind of like they they're the ones who kind of almost gave me the ability to do this um but uh so what so, i call uh, an, so an, like a uh, uh, sorry a level one visions and sometimes i get level one visions where i see all the detail like it's his eyes and I see the moment. And yeah, and there's some crazy level one details from that life where I see the whole picture. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so did you ask the, uh, the Grace to give you this uh, talent or they just uh, gave it to you as a gift without you even asking for it? Uh, that's a... Uh, that's not the right frame of reference. Um, the best way to think about it is, uh, I think it's something that we both wanted. Yeah. And they, though I was young at the time, I was 16 when that happened, but, um, <clears throat> but I didn't, so I wasn't thinking, I consciously want that, that ability. That's not the way that happened. Uh, but, uh, for me, in my understanding of that species, they're very aware of big picture human life. Uh, so you think it's about you, but they're actually dealing with their, your kind of like your larger life plan, if you will, your larger life perspective. So they knew something about that. They knew that these abilities would help uh, things. And uh, and that's the, the what I see out of that. Um, it's big picture to talk about as well too but uh so you're you're saying that um the particular race you're dealing with uh is not just trying to help you as an individual they're trying to help uh society or not just society but you know reality overall they're trying to help everybody move forward and they understand that helping you as an individual does that uh okay hold on so are we sidetracking from the original the original stuff? Not uh, really. I mean, okay. I'm yeah. I'm trying to get a, a better understanding of of what they are like through how they're treating you. Yeah. Um so okay, repeat the question specifically. Like okay, so it <clears throat> seems like okay, you just stated that they um that they're trying to help things in general move forward and by helping you as an individual that helps everybody move forward so okay uh, so that uh that is separate those two things are separate for me at least um so i i, I think of them as like scientists as well too so they're kind of like consciousness scientists evolution scientists and um so i think they uh i think there was some kind of a resolution that needed to happen on my side that they saw um they also uh but then but then there's like a whole bunch of stuff that unravels from this right and and i think they see that big picture so if they give an, an, an individual human an ability to be sensitive to their past life awareness and kind of pick things up very uh eventually over time uh with some kind of degree of accuracy then what they're also doing is they're sharing their show. Then when I come out publicly and talk about this stuff, then that ends up showing a perspective of them. 
So here I am going through my own personal stuff about this content and I'm able to, you know, I'll be able, I, I plan to do presentations on it. I have actually, I won't say it here. I'm a, I'm in, I'm written in history at one point. And so I'm, I'm able to, and I will be able to show that detailed information the way I'm able to do that with this last past life. Um, and when I do that, I'll be pointing the fingers at them because I'll be saying, think about it as a, as humans, here we are without that information and we have our own, we have a single frame of reference of reality. But if you're that species and you are able to do this type of stuff, um, then I think we're looking at a birth and, a species who's beat the birth and death life cycle. Uh, we're, they obviously have the science behind it too. They have a science behind the human birth and death life cycle. They're understanding things in a greater picture. And, uh, and then therefore we have to think about how they're interacting with us the likelihood that they're coming from that perspective is uh, very, very, very high. And and I haven't seen any evidence that that's not the case so far. Uh, everything seems to be a larger picture perspective that goes on with the aliens. Every contact that I've interacted with has a, there does seem to be a larger perspective that ends up going on. They may have done something at one point, but then it resolves itself in a kind of a growth of consciousness, you know, uh, years later. And, uh, and my own story is very much like that as well, too. So, um, I, I just I think that this is where disclosure goes. I think this is what contact alien contact goes um, is the is that humans are actually going to evolve into a type of consciousness that somehow has an awareness or starts to begin to gain an awareness about these about who we all really are is that we've been recurring you know in energy forms uh, and that you know can we even be angry at the killer because were we once a killer probably. And vice versa, we're gonna have we're gonna have an existential crisis on our hands from such a from such a larger kind of uh, truth of reality that this is that this is the way humans have been living. Um, so that's what I think is going so, on here. So yeah. basically, uh, by treat by helping you discover your past lives, they're making you a better uh, spokesperson for them when you speak about them because you you're you're giving the truth that this particular race is um understands the big picture and is willing to help you as an individual and us as a species uh to move forward they're they're grooming you as a good uh spokesperson by helping you it's not a, there's nothing surreptitious about it it's just they're being a a friend to you which makes you automatically a friend to them Interesting. Uh, okay, yeah, I, I probably resist a little bit of the word spokesperson because it has uh, strange human connotations. <laughs> but I think you're right, and and the picture that you got, I think you're bang on actually. And it and it and because what's happened is that I've come out uh, in a world where a whole lot of people think the Greys are are very negative species, and I'm actually really up had it like I'm I'm confronting them. I'm like, you have to a show me the proof because. All the contactees I'm, I'm actually interacting with aren't really talking like that, and there and we we can't absolve a big picture, uh, a species that may have such a large big picture about the nature of reality. And if they do, then they are going to interact with us in a very different way. They might come off cold when they're actually very dimensional instead, uh, things like that. So, uh, and when I've kind of prevented those bigger pictures in the presentations I've done. Um, th there isn't any pushback because I'm really providing as much evidence I can to a myself and my own story uh, and my own perspective of it. And then just saying, listen, like, hey, you've got a different perspective. Show me the evidence for it. And in the end, no one actually had the evidence. Uh, no one still has the evidence. And I'm dealing with researchers now and, and, and no one's providing me with big picture, you know, crazy, dark demon aliens. And that's not what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a high level, high consciousness High, high evolution type uh, species and that that's how it interact and that's how it affects us is this larger growth that kind of ends up getting created from it so well, let me jump to the end of the story and then we'll come back to the beginning sure okay. i um i've been to quite a few mufon meetings and the best mufon meeting i ever went to nobody showed up to i was the only person there except there was one other person there besides me and she had her family and her, her son and her husband were in the library, which, um, you know, they didn't care about aliens. And so it was the one abductee, she was an abductee, and myself. So it was the best MUFON meeting I ever went to because I got to sit down and talk to somebody like yourself one-on-one -on -one for 20 minutes or so. 
and it wasn't about lights in the sky. It was about abduction and aliens and something from a deeper perspective than you generally get to uh, experience at a MUFON meeting. It wasn't about lights in the sky. So anyway, uh, I in that process uh, of sitting there with this lady, this abductee, uh, one of the things I said was, are they going to invade? You know, and uh, not having a not having a uh, position one way or the other. I just wanted to hear her answer, and she said, "Yes, they they will uh, take over the planet <laughs> at some point." And, yeah. But but here, but she she didn't say it in the context of of how you hear it these days. It was very different. Okay, she said specifically. She said. Uh, this is not going to happen when anybody's alive today. It won't happen in your lifetime or my lifetime. It won't happen in your ch- kid's lifetime. It won't happen in your kid's kid's life. It's like four, five, six generations Man, down the road. Interesting, yeah. And uh, I know, I know from my own research and readings that that time in the future, the population of Earth is down to like somewhere between 10% and 1% of what it is now. Right. So they're not taking over and displacing us. What they're doing is repopulating the Earth after it's been depopulated, right. which is very different from what you're hearing people talk about today because people don't really understand the context, the, you know, what year and this and that. They all think, yeah. oh, any day now it's, they're going to take us over, right. which is further, could be, couldn't be further from the truth. Right. So having said that, uh, do you have any time frame for the city? No, no, it's a great question. And yeah, I don't. I don't actually. They never, it's, uh, I have I have no information like that. And um, as the book basically shows that uh, uh, it's really a story uh, really about genetics and the human origins. And then they start kind of bending it towards there'll be events. There is like a, uh, planet events i guess you can call them so this is all they were showing me and also that these things are, re- are like will be happening soon oh it's about it's t- it's almost time to change or it's almost time for these things to occur it's basically how they frame it and uh within that they're like and then there'll be a city and then they just wanted me to basically tell people that like tell them that we're coming and that there were these great alien human hybrids and i always i always kind of really emphasize that this is for me it was symbolic because as a human, I ha- I require some things to say, I know for certain, twenty forty five or you know I, I need to see a future time. I need to see, they didn't even show me the future. They just she showed it to me in this kind of, you know, uh, symbolic imagery in that she projected out, uh, in into my mind. And then I'm left with uh, her saying, "Tell them that, that we're coming, and uh, and that there will be a city when we do." And that's all I'm left with. So, uh, and then I'm but there's a couple pieces to that but there's no timeline like that and i actually uh it's funny that you say her her perspective i actually really really like that and i actually i've talked with about this with other contactees too i don't know we don't know if this is in our lifetime or not and uh and for whatever reason they wanted that information out and they wanted like everything very planned by them right write the book out they told me to do that and uh so the timing of it is is something that they were all wanting to be a part of so well okay so I don't know what you, how much you've been paying attention to what people have been saying recently, but um, I don't know if it was a remote viewer or somebody I was listening to. I think it probably was a remote viewer, but they were saying that, okay, so we're now in 2023, right? They, they were saying that by 2050, that something happens between now and 2050. I've heard so, that one. Yeah. Yeah. So you've heard the same thing I've heard. Okay. That means that in the next 27 years, uh, we either all get wiped out by an asteroid or a comet or, yeah. or a uh, super volcano or. Uh, mine's the great waves. Yeah. Mine's the great say waves. Again? Mine's the great waves. Ocean waves that uh, they actually showed it to me on a hologram that there's a there's an alteration in the electromagnetic field of the planet. And, and it causes a, a warp, and that, that creates a huge tidal wave. Uh, that information matched Linda Moulton Howe's that she got from an S4 scientist. 
Uh, so yeah, I don't know, man. I hear, I, I don't like, I don't even like talking like this kind of stuff yet. It seems to be the funny thing is, is that for all the people who've read my book, it doesn't phase them because they've already heard this type of stuff before. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, really crazy how apocalyptic events are part of all this. So you think that it's going to be a wave that wipes out? That's what they told me. I don't, uh, I don't, you know, that's it. I mean, they showed it to me. So, yeah. But again, it wasn't a future event as much as I'm, they're showing these things on holograms and then they're giving, it's imparting the information to me. Uh, Not like it's a future event, but that this is going to happen. And then they're showing it to me on a, on a hologram. Yeah. Well, let's go back to the beginning now uh, and go through uh, the things that you've experienced. So, you, well, sorry, by the way, that uh, the 2050 that you mentioned is a CIA guy. So he was um, uh, so that comes from uh, a, he was the he was the head guy in charge of that CIA remote viewing program. And then he went and, and he fully saw alien alien bases on planet Earth. And then he's the one someone said, go look in the future. And then he went and did and he saw 2050 that humans and aliens were living together and that uh, there were big cities and that the rest was all farmland and that humans. It was basically a a shared community of aliens and humans. Well, there's one thing you may wish to do. Uh, uh, There's a book. uh, I don't I doubt if you've read it, but maybe you have. It's called uh, Mass Dreams of the Future. Um, no, very interesting. Okay, yeah. so Chet Snow, I, I, one of the people I interviewed on my podcast knew uh, knows Chet Snow personally, and he's still alive, as far as I know. I may have, maybe he'll be on my podcast one day. But he and his partner uh, traveled around. Uh, I don't know if it's the United States or the world, but they would uh, work with people for stop smoking in mass groups, like 100 to 1 to 300 people-ish. Uh, I have no idea re- what it really was, but large numbers of people, they would put uh, regress at the same time and get them to stop smoking as a group, and they would each pay whatever. And that's how they met. Instead of doing individual sessions, they did that. And afterwards, uh, and after they got through with the uh, stop smoking part, they would hand. They would go through the future. They would take them out of the future. They would take them to 2050, uh, 2150, 2250. You know, on, on hundreds of years apart into the future, and say, "What do you see then?" Over and over and over. And then if it was all over, uh, they would hand them uh, surveys to say, you know, to write down what did you see in this year and that year and the other year. And they would uh, compile it all, and that's what came out the book uh, *Mass Dreams of the Future*. And if you read it, it, it talks about there being um, the remaining humans on the planet at some point are living under huge glass domes, and the rest of the Earth is either uh, some of it's pristine and some of it is like we had a nuclear war, maybe. Mm-hmm. So that. That's another thing is that Putin and uh, Biden may decide to pull the bu- uh, push the button at some point soon, and and uh, we may all get wiped out because of that. I keep hearing from people that that the aliens won't allow that, and because they have the talent to be able to stop it, doesn't mean they will. And so anyway, I'll let all that go because we're here to talk about you. Uh, so. Um, <clears throat> After picking up your past lives, what what's the next thing strange in your life? Um, uh, as a child, you're saying, right? So as, as we're kind well, of to... w- what age were you when you pes- picked up your past lives? This was like, but I see, I didn't think of it that way. So this was six, five, six, and seven, that kind of thing. Yeah. And you picked up your past life without just by being yourself, just. Uh, yeah. Pretty much, yeah, I guess so, yeah. Well, but so, again, it's, it's snippets, so I, I don't consider it a huge big deal because it's just tiny pieces. The real core of that past life awareness came much later in my life. So well, just, some, people, some people pick up their – one technique for, for a person picking up their past life is to focus, to meditate and focus on uh, – like say that they've had a pain all their life since from birth. Mm-hmm. And if they focus their awareness on that pain – and keep it focused on that pain for a period of time, they'll pick up 
where they got the pain from, which can oh. be past life. That's interesting because that's the emotional part. So if I have a te mental tendency, that's a great one. Thanks for that. Uh, yeah, but if I have a mental tendency or an emotion I can't resolve that uh, is created by some kind of conflict. Like, so I have like two friends who for me were in that past life and I'm trying to figure out why do I ever always feel this way about them. Uh, then I focus on it and I can get imagery. And that's uh, and the imagery. Uh, yeah, and the whole thing for me is I always prove it to myself. So the imagery had uh, eventually something that I recognized. Um, you're saying you've, you've done that. You've done what you're just talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, but see, that happened naturally for me. I, I was able to just figure that stuff out. I didn't read about it or, or see that anyway. So. so you focused on an emotion that had to do with somebody you knew. Yeah, unresolved and, stuff with them. Yeah, that's right. And that gave you your past life? Uh, again, snippets. Uh, well, how many, how many past lives are you familiar with? Okay. Uh, four, five, six, seven. So seven in detail. <clears throat> so go through each of those in very 50,000 foot perspective. You, know, you did this and you did that. Oh, I didn't ask you, uh, the man who was cooked by Hitler in the <laughs> gas chambers, uh, what did he do for a living? Oh, he was going to be a rabbi. So he, uh, uh, he was in training. He, yeah, he, uh, he was young. Like he, so <clears throat> he was either 18 or 19, something like that, when they, when they actually invaded. So when they changed, right? So he had, he lived in the ghetto. And but that experience of the ghetto, like, you know, how they ghettoized. So they ghettoized the cities. And so he experienced that. And, uh, and when it was clear that I think they were, I'm not, I'm not really certain they were clearing out the ghettos. That's when they they ended up running away. And so they ended up living in the forest. And that's that's a part of it. They lived in the forest for I don't know how long. All this could have been like months or weeks for all I know. I'm not really I don't have the timelines. And then they were caught in the forest. And uh, uh, and that's it. The family got separated. And 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 I don't see those people ever again. And and I don't know. how. But he's young. And I know that because they end up. Uh, trying to keep him alive and doing, um, uh, you forget the experiments, but uh, like they tried to like physical labor. So they needed him for physical labor. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens at that period that carried over as a child um, and that were unexplainable to me, behaviors I had and things that. Uh, uh, so, for example, I, I'm, I don't know what I was carrying, but rocks maybe or something. And then if I dropped them, the guards beat the crap out of you. And so when I was a child, a four and five year old child, I would drop a plate and I would boom, just pure terror. And I ran and I would, I had so many friends, several friends houses with which I would drop things. My mom never, my mom never like disciplined me in a way that would terrify me. And my mom was always very cautious and, you know, it's okay that you broke something, but for whatever reason, I would boot it and literally leave the house and run out of the door. And that happened several times. Uh, and for me, I now recognize the lingering kind of like, you know, effect of these things. And uh, yeah, stuff like that. But sorry, so, you, you have to question so, and see, I can't even connect because so there's so many pieces I have, right? Yeah. Go through each of your seven lives very briefly and say uh, anything you remember about them, you know, like uh, this okay. was a woman who did this. And oh, when you do it, include the part that carries over into your current life. Okay. okay, so there's something I haven't chilled with you yet. So we're talking about past life awareness here. So, um, okay, so I have all those snippets. Let me just give you a, a piece here. We'll go. Then we'll do this fun game you've made up here. I like it. Uh, but uh, so I'm in history, recorded history, and uh, and I I have the past life awareness of uh, Marcus Antonius, the Roman, the Roman general. Wow. Who, yeah. Who? And so that's the reason the aliens did this. Okay. There there's a larger picture going on here. And I've proven over and over and over again, when I finally go public in a very big presentation, I'll be pulling out, uh, historians are very confused by Mark Anthony's life, actually. And they haven't put the pictures together, and I will be the one who gets to do it. I'll be matching it up with Roman law, Roman traditions, uh, things that no historians were able to put together. It's going to be a big, fun thing for me to do. But the way I got those memories out is... <clears throat> um, 
uh, I, I learned a couple things about getting my alien memories out. So I learned that, uh, you know, you, like if I had a calendar and I, I have the somatic memory, like the somatic feel, like I can feel Mark Anthony's body. So the somatic memory really retains itself in the, in the, in the ethereal body, or whatever transfers over and his mind frame. So I can sometimes, anyway, I can grab those. I call them anchors. So when I have a, a glimpse, then it's an anchor. And I, I can prove that glimpse is real by having some kind of information about that period. And then once that anchor is there, I can expand on it. And what I eventually learned is that if I take a Roman calendar and go through it, like January, February, I can get images of that year. So I started doing that. I started building the the journal of Mark Anthony's life. And uh, so that's that helped with some of these other past life pieces when I started saying, OK, that's the vibration. That's the feeling of that life. That's the feeling of that life. Um, and, and that's the feeling of a, having a past life awareness. So I was able to kind of take this big picture stuff. So that's helped contribute to what, some of this awareness that I have now and the the ability to make to play this game that you want to, uh, me to do here. So, um, okay, so did that help at all now <laughs> with the big picture uh, here? <laughs> that, was, that was great. I mean, uh, uh, the more you give of your techniques of how you pull up your past lives, the more interesting this conversation will be. So the giving that is definitely... Uh, a way of enriching this conversation. People yeah. want to hear not they don't just want to hear the content of your past life. They want to know how you how you how you grabbed it because they want to do the same thing for yeah. themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so let, let me let me focus in on that Mark Anthony, that that Roman life. And then uh, and then I'll be very happy to 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 make it kind of a big picture here. Um well, yeah, I mean, in the case of like a, something like that, like, a, I guess, you know, 2000 year old past life, um, it was much easier to connect with my present life, the last life. So there's something very linear going on, too, right, with with past lives and awareness. Um, but uh, the the again, it's that whole idea that the mind, it's like getting the mind out of the way. And and here's the other part, too, about Mark Anthony's that he died um the desires you have at the end of your life, you retain those desires, right? And Mark Anthony felt unjust when he died. He felt like he wasn't understood. And so here he, he is this latent desire pushing out memories. Like it, it, it wants, it was a part of that guy who wants me to have those memories out. And so, um, so it happens naturally almost. Like there's some of the memories of meeting some of the very famous politicians of that time, Cicero, uh, like the, Mark Anthony's first memory of Cicero is well in his head. And uh, so uh, those things came out naturally in when states when I was able to, I was doing nothing. I was probably, I think I was in bed uh, daydreaming, uh, like drifting off to sleep. And then all of a sudden I had this intense memory of being in the forum. And, uh, and, and again, some of the detail matched historical content after I learned about it. Um, so, and then once I have those, I was able to go, uh, uh, yeah, through the calendar and kind of, uh, so the anchoring was the kind of the bigger picture, uh, picture to it, and then able to go through the calendar, a Roman calendar. And as I did it, kind of like a, like automatic writing, I guess, is the idea. I think that's what it's called, where you kind of just like don't think about anything and you kind of go through a picture, or you go through a, uh, in this case, it's a calendar. And as I went through a specific year, I'd focus on the body of what a, that body felt like in that year, five or six year old child. And I could pick up images and then learned that that ma those images match something either about the time frame or uh, or about Roman history in general. And uh, yeah, so, OK, that's 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 the gist of that. So <laughs> uh, wasn't he uh, Cleopatra's lover? Is that true? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He was Cleopatra's lover. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> So did you pick up any of that uh, about her, anything about her in the, in your. Yeah, I fully, I fully am aware um, even why the relationship started. Um, so uh, what's not in history is that her own, the, the Ptolemaic country was in civil war, actually. She was always under threat of civil war, her own administration. So though you have to, it's not in history, right? You, you only pieces of people grab this in, uh, information properly, but I mean, historians grab this information properly. Um, so there were a Greek, a Greek uh, administration over top of a, a religious Egyptian country, 
And unlike like Rome or Greece, uh, the administrators, uh, the, the people running the Egyptian country were religious figures. So you would actually have a priest who dealt with your taxes or a priest who dealt with your, uh, anyway, your, your infrastructure. While the Greek, Alexandrian, Alexandrian Greek, uh, Ptolemaic Greek ran the entire country as this administration system. And so they butted heads all the time. And, and she was a woman, so they hated her. Uh, and so she was fighting with her own country all the time. That's not written in history at all. And uh, and Mark Anthony was saving the day. So it basically looked like she was the country was about to break out in the Civil War right at 39 BC. It's not written anywhere in history. And then she comes in because she Caesar when she was involved with Caesar that solved again the problem for her to gain power in her own country. Uh, and so she's looking for that resolution again. And so she gets Mark Anthony. And uh, it's kind of like two broken people. Mark Anthony was a killer. He was brutal. He was vicious. Uh, he was broken. He was very broken, uh, broken ego. And so was she. And so there, it's like the classic, like Sid and Nancy kind of idea, like these two broken people. And uh, they did actually fall in love with each other, but they also hated each other. So it's like a love hate relationship that occurred. Um, she got together with him uh, based off of her prophet saying, you and me are going to have a child together. And uh, and he's like, oh, tell me more about this prophet. And then they they make love. And when they do, it's in public, not in public, but it's a religious event because she's a she's an ISIS. She is a goddess. So he, when they do this thing, it has to be a huge religious ceremony. Uh, and then once it occurs, she goes to her, those people, the administrating people who are fighting with her. And she says, look, I have the power of Rome on my side now. So, you know, back off and you can't you can't fight you can't fight me anymore and that's how their relationship gets solid uh, solid uh and then they start a family together they start a family very early on it's recorded in history that happens much later and it actually the plans for it start very early on uh she basically allows him through a written agreement that he can become the pharaoh while you're here you become the pharaoh uh and so it's all it's all agreements it's all mental the history writes it like it's all loose and they're all just you know screwing with each other but it's actually she's she's trying to keep her her country alive and keep herself in power uh though some of the debauchery is very real uh that did happen but um it, there was always context for these things that uh, historians kind of uh, uh, don't understand so yeah. so go through your other lives <laughs> okay so mark anthony every life right that we have were we are <clears throat> uh, we're affected by the some other life Right. We're affected by the karmas of uh, the tendencies of that life. Mark Anthony is so a previous life. He was Greek. He was Greek. And I know that I had a, a Thebe. I was Thebes. I was in Thebes. And uh, and so Mark Anthony is unresolved about that life. And he's a Greek lover. He goes down in Folian history and the Roman history as being a, a lover of Greeks. And he is fulfilling a part of his own karma at the time. And so uh, so I know there's a Theban life. Then there's the Mark Anthony life. Uh, you said about how it, um, the thing is, is that you're always, uh, okay. Well, the way that Mark Anthony connects to the present is that no moment between the 2000 years that spanned from the Mark Anthony life to this life and all the lives in between, has there ever been so much freedom as there was in that life? So the freedoms experience I experience now only match the freedoms Mark Anthony experienced 2000 years ago and every other life I've lived. I was kind of death. I, you know, you're born into something. You have to be something. You have to do something, and you have to stick with that. And you can't do anything else. And uh, and so there's a really weird connection of of the freedom I experience now is the same freedom that relatively Mark Anthony still was under a class system, but uh, he was a privileged in his class system. And uh, and so that's a really weird uh, connecting piece there. Um, I was a Jew again, oddly enough. By the way, there's a Jewish connection here that I think the aliens are aware of. Because Mark Anthony uh, affected, people don't know this, he actually influenced biblical history. He installed Herod the Great. And uh, and so Herod the Great is known in the Bible. And uh, that's really interesting. And then I was a Jew under Herod the Great, funny enough, that very following life. Uh, I was a, uh, uh, an Essene, There's, they're called the Essenes. And uh, and I fully remember the cave that he was, they, they grew up in caves 100% and that's all in history. And uh, and I fully remember the cave that this guy grew up in. Hold on, hold, stop for a second. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so 
Um, so you hear a lot of people talk about the views of the Essenes as if that's a fact. These are these views, like uh, Sophia and and uh, different uh, spiritual slash religious writings, like Gaia and Sophia and so forth and so on. They talk about those Essene beliefs as if uh, as if there's no question that they're facts. Like just like a Christian believes in Christ. Yeah. Uh, so I guess my question is, how do you feel about the Essene beliefs about Sophia and Gaia and all? How do you I, feel about all that stuff? I don't know any of that. I don't. Uh, I don't have any of the. I have theological knowledge about about Jesus. I was very interested in the theological content and and how why we you know the the actual history that that you can delve into like at least the writings when they thought they were made and what happened in Jewish history to create someone like him. Uh, but I don't know anything about. Uh, I never delved into this past life and I and I know of it because I because of the geography and uh, and some things that happened in that era. But um, again, like wells, there's all this random information and visions I had that were very tied to it and also linked to people in my life presently. Um, but uh, as far as like any of the, like the Roman stuff, I can answer that with, but I don't have that that uh, that knowledge or- Okay, well, well go, on with your, uh, go on with your past lives. Okay, I don't know, uh, in between that Jewish life, which this would have been around you know, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. And I don't know what happens in between. At some point, I'm in Afghanistan, uh, the, the Kush Mountains, the Hindu Kush Mountains, and I am a an archer. And I'm actually convinced it's it's uh, the Mongols, uh, Genghis Khan's army uh, invades. And they and they kill me, and I get an arrow in my in my lung, and I die on a on a on a on a castle, uh, on a peak of a castle, uh, as the ar invading army basically takes over. Um, I have very few memories of that life, but he was an angry man as well too, an army angry man. And um, at some point, I don't also don't. Uh, <clears throat> again, it's all like mid 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 millennia stuff. I'm not really clear. Eventually, it was a woman. <clears throat> And the woman is betrothed to a a man, and she is very upset with the life, and she ends up killing herself. So I have a I have this bad karma of a life with which a woman who kills herself. And then in the following life, I have a birth defect, <clears throat> and um, this would be about 1700s. I'm aware of that. By this point, the, this next life is the 1700s, and uh, I had some clear memories about this that were associated with uh, in Tibet. When you were having, if you had uh, babies were born with defects, they were left to uh, to uh, you know to die, and an orphanage uh, would pick a temple orf a temple would take them as an orphan, and then the temple would raise them, and that was what happened to me. So I have this birth defect from the from the killing of the self, and then I ended up in a temple. And I ended up oh, I was a monk in the uh, monk. So uh, they're all very spiritual. I was a monk at. I, th I think it was the life before that woman because – and that would have been like 1600s, 1500s crusades. And I'm certain he's Spanish. So he – and he full-on like boring. He is bored. Uh, and he's born into the – he's – by 16, he is sent to the, the monastery. And full-on like, you know, he could be doing spiritual things with people. Instead, he wants to get drunk. And he's just a monk and he's like bored with life. Um, and then there's the woman and then there's this Tibetan – temple life uh and then he becomes a like an ascene or a, a, like a like a like a sage or like a guru and he goes and he travels and he and he basically is on uh he lives very simply uh trying to spread the teachings of this uh group that he was that he was kind of a part of and he's doing that in 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 india and i don't know i've actually tried to find his, any information about this person and i couldn't find anything um, and then it's the Jewish life, which was the, the last, the Holocaust life. And then it's me. And so, I, and I can see how that kind of more guru life affected the, the, I can feel 
that that so when you're you're when you're kind of becoming you know enlightened or whatever you have love in you and he was he was that jewish guy was born in these deep feelings of love and he was actually trying to love the entire time so as the the nazis are coming in and he's trying to love his family and he's trying to provide hope for people and he's 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 taking care of his older brothers and he's taking care of his wife and he's trying to love everybody and trying to be the good guy and then in the end he ends up um getting so screwed up by the concentration camp that he loses his faith and so it's this complete fall uh, of consciousness it's in my book when the aliens show me this past life, I'm crying. I'm the I'm the I'm the Jew who's died in the Holocaust, and I'm bawling. So uh, it's this extreme drop of like kind of consciousness that occurs in that life, and then what happens in this life is me rectifying all this stuff. Uh, so uh, it's it's basically the correcting and rectifying. And I've noticed from all the past lives, that's always what's going on. You're correcting and rectifying. Uh, Mark Anthony was extreme, and so he had this extreme classism that made him. Uh, very take advantage of people. And then the next life, it's flipped where as a Jew, he was the bottom and he had to, uh, so you're rectifying, you're always rectifying parts of your consciousness, parts of your personality, parts of the mind, the ethereal mind as it's moving through time and space. And uh, and so that's what's going on here. <laughs> so, picture. Um, and you got all seven lives primarily by getting your mind out of the way? Yes, yes. And yeah. when you say uh, you meditate and you got your mind out of the way, what what specifically do you do in your meditations to get your mind out of the way? Be specific. Okay, well, I follow a Vedic practice. So Which I'm, I, I have people a... People um, are not going to know what that means. So. Yeah, I have, I have a, I have a uh, Vedic guru. So I actually, I have a, I have a, uh, a sad guru. And I uh, was taught... Uh, he's private, so I won't go into anything about him uh, too much, but uh, it's Patanjali's style of meditation. So it's a central point of focus and uh, and breath. So you're focusing on breath and uh, creating a, a, a natural rhythm of in, pause, out, pause. Uh, I'm focusing on sound on the inside and I'm focusing on breath. Uh, and, uh, sorry, a, a, a point of focus. And so I'm creating an intense point of focus uh, on, on kind of like a space in the third eye. And uh, and that's what my practice would be. So your your uh, that f type of meditation is um, being in the moment meditation. Yes. Uh, uh, sure. Yes, it does. Yes. Yes. You, you're practicing um, being aware of everything within you and around you in that moment, so that you're totally present. Um, as a point of focus, you're actually not even you're. You're literally just, it's, um, there's two types of meditation, focused meditation and open awareness meditation. So uh, this is focused meditation. So open awareness would be kind of aware of all things, putting yourself in the moment, while focused is, uh, you're not doing that. You're kind of just putting, you're saying, here's a dot, and I'm just going to put all my focus and concentration on that thing. And what it does for me is it gets the the intellect out of the way. And uh, yeah, and then you can have a kind of a clean experience of pure of pure beingness in the inside so it's kind of the opposite of what i was saying it's not <laughs> open awareness it's focus yeah okay so um so you focus on your third eye correct uh that is yeah that is correct yeah and so when you say you focus on your third eye do you mean to say you focus on uh the middle of your head where your pituitary gland is or you focus on uh, a point on your forehead looking forward or you focus beyond your uh, your body in front of you or when you be a little yeah. more specific about where your focus is. Yeah, the focus is right here. It's, it's about, uh, what is that? Five inches, four or five inches. As if there's like, as if a, a gem was sitting right, right in the front of the, of the forehead. And, and, about there, yeah. and you, and, and you are, Eyes closed, eyes partially open, eyes opened, or what? Yeah, I close my eyes. I focus. I have a yeah. I close my eyes. Yeah. Okay. So though you're focusing just beyond your body in the front of you, do you notice the light that's inside of you? That's a part of you that uh, people, you know, when I was learning meditation, um, for the first year or two, or even more than that, 
I never really noticed the light that is part. That's what you are inside of you that you can see. You don't notice that. You only notice, well, it's dark in here. Uh, there's darkness. You don't really recognize the light until at some point you have a realization. And it's not, it's nothing uh, super awesome. It's just a very small realization that you can see the light that is you that's inside of you. And so you see that light, yes? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you're focusing just beyond uh, the front of your body at your third eye at a point just beyond your body and you notice the light inside of you. Um, do you have a tendency to want to fall asleep when you do this because you're no, no, no tendency at all? No. You don't get you don't feel any uh, any drowsiness or anything if you do this for how long can you do that with without uh, and 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 without having to draw your mind? Do you have to draw your mind back? You know, you have your thoughts, and so you have to pull your mind mm -hmm. back. Um, that's regular. I'd say that's that's pretty normal, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and I have a uh, and it's a weird game uh, of the push and pull. I used to teach meditation, actually. So um, sometimes you can solve your problems, actually, and in this I state of. Uh, focus and then your mind wanders and kind of bring you back and then within that you can kind of solve problems and it's a uh, so yeah i'm 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 not uh yeah it definitely happens let's put it that way so and it's part of the process yeah. okay so we've gone over uh the fact that you were once a uh, person who was uh cooked in the uh in the uh <laughs> In the yes. gas chambers by Hitler and his minions, and you were Mark Antony, and you were uh, a Jewish lady. Yes. No, no, I know it's also confusing. I uh, I was a uh, Jerusalem um, in Israel or at the time wasn't even called Israel. Uh, it's the province of Judea. That's what it was. Yeah, province, pro Roman province of Judea. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been you you picked Man. up seven past lives. Go beyond the seven lives. What's the next interesting thing that happened in your life? Uh, it, it may have been before you picked up these lives or after, yeah. but somewhere in your early life, you had other strange things happen to you besides you picking up your past lives. What else? Yeah, sure. So, okay. So the aliens were interacting with me in a period of my life uh, that I didn't, so I didn't have the awareness that they were there, right? They were obscuring the memory. And in the year 1997, roughly around that, 1996, 97, um, I started to, I guess, awaken my spiritual side, if you will. So I started having some psychic ability, psychic things going on where I was uh, premonitions, I guess, right? Having uh, aware of what, what might happen during the day, uh, thinking about someone and then seeing them, you know, that, that day. Uh, someone you haven't seen in, you know, years kind of thing. Um, that all started happening in the year 1997. I was 19. I was 19, turning 20 in that year, uh, and that's the beginning of the. And I was having alien contact, and I didn't know about it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that that really starts to <clears throat> peak in the year 1997. And so, it's just so, premonitions is really the way I kind of frame that premonition. So, what um, when you say you're having contact, but you weren't aware of it? What was happening that you were not aware of? So I had seven. So uh, from uh, I had one contact event near sixteen when I was sixteen years old. Uh, one when I was. <clears throat> uh, so then I, they happened. You know, this happened when I was on my way home from hanging out with friends, and it happened. Uh, oh, 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 I'll stop for a second. So yeah, yeah. So don't don't blow past any of your alien. Sure. Let's go to your very first alien event that you have any awareness of, and go. Go through each one without uh, without glossing over it. Okay, so do you even want me to talk about the child? I want you to talk about everything, everything you've ever experienced regarding aliens, even if it even if you picked it up in a regression later. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm aware um, I was handled as a baby by it. So when you get the feeling of the gray alien looking into your eyes, uh, then you're like. Oh, well, wait a minute. And I could feel things like throughout my life. And um, and I know I don't have the full understanding, but I know as a baby, 
uh, that I'd been picked up and I looked into the eyes. I could feel the baby presence. I could feel me as that little shrinked, shrunken thing. And it was mesmerized by the eyes as it, as I, as it was staring, as it was, I think, trying to connect with me. And I'm convinced. So I end up having this kind of lead uh, gray alien that I end up interacting with. Uh, I called her the elder. And, uh, and it ends up being, uh, I'm certain it was the elder. I'm certain when I was born, they had a, some type of quick abduction or quick contact event. And, uh, and, I'm, and I look into her eyes. And uh, I don't know what else happens there. So uh, that's no regression. That's just I know that that happened. <clears throat> then at five, um, <clears throat> at five years old, this I did a regression on. And I knew I had flashbacks that had actually occurred. Something had happened in the back of my friend's house. What's really weird is that this friend seems to be the center point of three contact events of a, as a child. That and I and I'm only with her for a year as a friend. So it's all condensed. It's so strange how it, they it happened with one friend who was a, I was a friend with for one year, and yet I have three contact events with her. And it's very weird how that happens. Um. So this was in the back. Uh, I, I don't even really fully understand it, to tell you the truth. I was, uh, we were in the backyard playing and um, someone approaches me and they are, I didn't, um, uh, they are projecting out a face on them. So like it's some kind of ability they have, right? I don't understand it uh, to to uh so when you look at them you're seeing a, a like like they're wearing a mask like a, a psychic mask or a telepathic mask or something and so i'm seeing a person and and he's saying hi hi like trying to get my attention walking up to me and um and and then i'm kind of stunned by this person and whatever he does he seems to uh put his hand out and when he does that i am flooded with an image of my mom on a medical bed <clears throat> and she is smiling and there's a giant needle going into her <clears throat> the aliens will use this memory later in my life to show me see we uh, you have uh, our dna in you and so they're showing me this moment <clears throat> and and so basically showing me this and uh and that's really uh all i have of that event uh then he left and he's like bye bye so he's he's a, such a strange uh interaction <clears throat> and he's like bye 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 with the same projecting of the face it's a, for such a strange you know event and then um me and that girl will have two more contact events and in them we uh so we like to play in the ravine by my house and twice we come back late at night and that's just that's just part of my childhood history i didn't think anything of it my mom had to call the cops. She was like, why aren't my kids coming back? Uh, and, uh, and the, you know, the both parents got together. They were concerned for us. Uh, the police were called. And, and, uh, and of course, we just nonchalantly show up at like 11 o'clock at night. And we don't think anything of it. Turns out um, when I, when I, when the memories were cracking open, I could feel that something had happened in the ravine. And that's why we were coming home late. And when I got those memories out, I did actually a regression on one of them. And it was obvious to me, well, that's when, okay, so we are in a craft, we're taken into this craft, <clears throat> uh, like zoomed in, like kind of just pulled into them. And uh, so we're separated, me and her, but the aliens are really interested in, um, like, uh, he's trying to get my attention. So he's like making me look at, look at a holographic bunny. So there's this like kind of bunny on this table. And he's like, look, look, look at this bunny. And then he's, I'm looking at this bunny and he says, okay, now look here. And he gets me to look at this device that seems to go into my head. And what I'm convinced happens here is they take a model of my brain as a child. I'm certain they, it goes into my eyes and goes, takes some kind of model of my brain. And then again, this is stuff they use as I, as I grew up as an adult and then I'm abusing this content. And I remember these on crafts. I have these, these memories end up being part of my story um, while I'm on, while I'm, while I'm uh, having the normal contact events that I'm very aware of as an adult. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so those are the kind of like base. I'm actually convinced there was another contact event with my parents. 
I was with, sorry, with my mom. And there's a really specifically strange time when we went to uh, Niagara Falls. And that would have also been around this time. And then there's one last contact event as a child. And I'm certain I was seven or eight. And it happens with the entire family. And I have a screen memory, a very bizarre screen memory of a truck driving backwards uh, on a highway. And we're, you know, uh, you're, you know, when you do a pull off of a highway and you go around a corner um, and I'm seeing as a child, a truck on the other side and there's no one in it and it's driving backwards. And for some reason, I don't tell my parents this strange memory, but it shocks me so much that when I go back into school that August, that September, so this was summer when I saw this, and we were driving towards Winnipeg, sorry, I'm not giving you any detail. Uh, we were driving toward, to Winnipeg uh, to see my grandparents, and I saw this truck driving backwards. So when I go to school, I get one of those books of the, you know, the mysteries of the unknown, and, on, and I'm really excited to, to see how I can tell someone about this truck driving backwards. And when I go and look at the back for like information, there's a section saying, tell us your stories. We want to know your stories. Unless you saw a truck driving backwards with no one in it, we won't believe you. I swear it says that. And so I get, I, I absorb this as a child and I don't think any more about it saying, Oh, that's really weird. What the hell is that all about? And I don't think, or under, I don't even think about it after that point. And it's not until the memory come, the memories come out, though I re remember like, wait a minute. And I was actually, I'd sc I had flashbacks. As soon as I, uh, as soon as the memories were coming out, I knew something had happened at that moment. And I could see that there was a metal craft on the field and and that actually we were taken. And, uh, and the screen memory was this truck driving backwards and it got lodged in my brain, the memory of it, because of me being excited to tell someone about it uh, in a book. And um, that's all very, very strange. And then the the, uh, the, the contact event was actually uh, me, my brothers, I have two older brothers. We were all taken into a craft and we were all put on medical beds and they were checking stuff out with us. And uh, and what you'll know from my contact events is that it's very biological what ends up happening. So they're, they're very interested in genes and genetics. And I'm certain that they were checking out you know, what my brothers were all about, or at least if they could do something with them, I have no idea. I really don't know, actually. And uh, we were all in medical beds. My mom was there. She was very concerned. Um, my mom knew them. That was the other weird part. Like, I would tell her this now, and she's like, well, I don't really know about anything about that. But uh, in my these memories, she knew. She knew them. She was clearly familiar with them, but she was uncomfortable. And uh, and that's it. That's it. Actually, that's the seven or eight. I think I'm seven or eight. I don't know the, the year that happens. Um, that's the contact events end at that point. And then they, and then 16, when I'm coming home, they start up again. And I, and, I, and the way I frame it in, in my, all the interviews I've ever done and everything is that that's where the relationship starts when I'm 16 years old. That's where I become familiar with them. That's when I get to know them and that's where it all starts. So there's these childhood things that, that kind of are them checking things out. And, you know, it seems very medical at times. And I was uncomfortable at times too. Like they weren't impersonal is the way I could frame the childhood stuff impersonal. Uh, okay, well, uh, besides knowing about your past lives, recalling those, and besides all your alien contacts, is, have you had anything else interesting happen in your life besides all the, we've, everything we've, that's, I, I don't necessarily think it's unrelated or related, but just uh, other things happen to you besides um, what we've talked about? Yeah, so, well, the other is, I mean, like, I could uh, speak to uh, people who have passed on. So, um, so several, and it seemed very related to, okay, uh, the alien, as you mentioned in the bio there, there was a consciousness event that happened when I was 20 years old. So that's the kind of, like, uh, the crux of the alien content was kind of culminating to this this event that happened, which was kind of the consciousness experience, I guess you could call it a Kundalini rising mixed with a genetic activation, uh, mixed with some kind of alignment because they had done something that, uh, anyway, it's just a culmination of high energy is really the best way to frame it. Um, that was 20 years old, Unpro unprovoked, un unprovoked actually is the way to frame that too. It didn't, it kind of just like happened out of, out of reading something. Well, okay. And, uh, stop for a second. So don't gloss over it. Go to the event and tell us 
give we want to hear every single little bit of detail that we can get our hands on our ears on uh, go ahead and tell the event <clears throat> okay to give all the detail i won't you have to read the book because there are some uncomfortable things and i don't want to talk about uh in an interview but uh but i did put them out in public in the book so no but, uh, but i can still give the gist of it so um now, I was, at that point, I think I mentioned 1997, I'd had uh, premonitions. So I was, uh, <clears throat> I had um, confirmed for myself, I guess, spirituality. So I was, I was a big believer that, you know, uh, we're able to connect to something larger. Uh, I felt like I was proving that to myself. And, uh, and therefore, there's more I can grab. There must be more I can, I can get out of that, that I didn't really understand how to do that or, or, or have any, there was no practice. I wasn't following anything. I was just uh, trying to, you know, push my own experience of consciousness. I ended up reading a book and uh, how do I frame that? Anyway, the book was actually about leaving your life behind and, uh, and, and it was, uh, worded in a way that was like, so I'd already experienced synchronicities and I was kind of taking it all very analytically. What's going on when I experience a profound event on the inside that matches something on the outside? What does that mean? What is that saying about the nature of reality in general? And so I ended up finding a book about people who abandoned their lives and committed themselves to God. And then when they traveled and lived on nothing, living for God, it turned out all these miracles can happen. All these synchronicities can happen, keeping them alive, making them float. When there was no food, all of a sudden there was food for them. When there was no place to stay, all of a sudden there was a place to stay. And something in me said, I have to do that. Only a part of me, because the other part of me said, that's totally insane, don't do that. Um, but something in me was saying, uh, I could ex I can experience that. Like I, I have the ability to experience something as intense as having all this detachment to the world, and then you're out there living like a, a hobo, and the universe will come in and protect you. And I uh, something anyway resonated resonated with me about it. <clears throat> the result was a. It's, it sounds without understanding the full details, and I can't go into it. Uh, it sounds totally insane, but it really was a like a. <clears throat> Uh, I, ended up, I ended up having like, a, 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 I can only understand it now as a Kundalini rising. I didn't know it at the time as that. And basically the bliss, unity. I was having unity experiences with uh, with 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 the world around me. I, I felt like I touched God and I wasn't trying to have these things happen. It was kind of in result of, uh, of, of having this experience. Um, the other part of it too was that my body had changed and I could feel light, uh, when I closed my eyes, I could feel that light was emanating from my body. And I now only know that other contactees have that kind of experience. And uh, like the cells of your light are kind of emanating, cells of your of your body are emanating light. And it was, oh, and I could feel, you know, an energy. I didn't know anything about chakras at the time. I could feel an, an energy culminating at the top. And it was this kind of, uh, uh, anyway, everything was really profound. The dreams were profound. The message was profound. Um, something had something had clicked in me so much to give me this awareness, and it all kind of said to me that means you should travel. <laughs> and I was like, kind of, because I was so altered by what had happened, this kind of change that occurred. I was freaked out actually by it because I didn't know what it all meant. I couldn't understand it, and only now do I understand there was an alien. Aliens were behind it all, uh, building that up. Actually, they were the ones who were building it up, and then they were the ones wanting it to occur. And uh, and that in the story, it's it's put it together nice, and the book is put it together a nice big picture, so it all makes sense. But uh, I eventually listened to myself, and I did go travel, and I did I did literally abandon my life. I literally sold all my belongings, cut my cards, uh, cut up my social insurance, everything, just driver's license, everything gone, and I ended up, uh, you know, living out of my car basically and traveling, um, and I started. Only at that point did I start having paranormal experiences and start seeing things in the sky. But I didn't have any of that beforehand. And I didn't, I couldn't even imagine this stuff was alien contact. You don't have the frame of reference for it. So, uh, yeah, that's that. <laughs> well, okay, so you told it, but you didn't tell it. So I know it's in your book and there's some things you don't want to talk about. I get that. But 
um, at a minimum, what I would like, I think the audience would love to hear, if you're willing to tell us, the actual Kundalini experience itself, the, the uh, what triggered it and uh, what it felt like and why you think it's Kundalini and, and how far it went. Because I've, I interviewed a lady recently, uh, a young lady, and she uh, talked about her Kundalini experience, and it's kind of rare. I mean, the one of the people who interviewed me said that she had her Kundalini uh, come on, and so uh, we got to. By if somebody wants to go and, and understand uh, what it's like when your Kundalini comes on, they can listen to that one interview. But I'd like to, at a minimum, hear how you experienced it in yeah. as much detail as possible. So um, the main part to it was that I, this thing that I, I was reading that about these people to abandon your life um, was that they didn't have sex. And so they were, the whole thing was to, to absolve yourself of a, of a sexual attachment. And at the time, I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I was actually looking for new spiritual things to try. So I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to try that, actually. And uh, that was the big one. <clears throat> These people then said something will happen to you if you do this. <laughs> and uh, let's just – I'm okay to talk about this. funny. I won't talk about the, the whole detail about, that, about what I read. But I'll mention this. Um, they said there's – they said – when you're hearing our message uh, and you're being purified by what we're saying, you're going to experience an orgasm in the night that is not sexual. And and the funny thing is that, okay, that happened first. This happened happened to me before I read it. So I, I it happened to me and I was like kind of put, I was like, what the hell? Like I never experienced that in my life. I still haven't actually since. So it's this kind of like release that gets created. And then, uh, then they talked about it and I was like, for me, there was a big message. I was, and it was this internalized experience I'm having. And then there's these people in this book, I'm talking about it. And it seemed very, very synchronistic. And, uh, uh, and also, um, the, other than that, I didn't have anything else except for the experience, which I've never been able to replicate either, uh, since, which was, uh, like, uh, uh, bliss, uh, unity, uh, God, <laughs> uh, uh, bliss, unity, God. And also like the sexual functions became, hmm, uh, withered. <laughs> uh, I could feel the lack of energy down there. I guess that's the way to frame it. I don't know. I don't know how to frame it any other way. It's actually just a, uh, a, a lack of, <clears throat> of, of, uh, it's hard to explain when you're when you're when you're putting awareness into any part of your body or function you actually put blood there and you and you create more energy there and when you stop you actually are able to release the energy and so there was something like that going on here where i actually could feel a distinct change in that area as a male and uh, and it was associated with this intense bliss 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 uh love uh like this high high energy that was kind of culminated out of it i didn't know these things at the time i didn't know kundalini i didn't know this stuff i didn't know any of it actually um i had a dream i wrote my dreams out at the time and one of them was climbing up a tree and at the top of the tree the you know the symbology was even kundalini at the time too and i didn't know it so it was like climbing up a tree and then the tree blew up the expanded up at the top and and i was the i was the one who climbed to the top of the tree and then at the top i had this kind of wild experience and so for me i'm like i can see it all now as like kind of kundalini symbology and having a vedic guru uh been able to really confirm that this is what this stuff was and and the sensations the 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 god i just keep going back to that because that's that was the culmination of it and i've never been able to replicate it since not the not the intensity and um that's that's pretty much that that's what i'm gonna kind of you know describe that as so um so you don't say exactly what you were doing uh, spiritually at the time that's i wasn't doing anything you weren't doing it just happened yeah it just happened now here's the thing 
when you when when it comes clear is the aliens were the ones who were doing it so there was contact events which which they were aligning energy in my body uh they were doing energy work in the contact events so they kept it all secret they covered it up and then me as a 20 year old i'm just reading a book and i have a kundalini rising i have this intense experience from from uh from just what i think reading a book but it's tied with a message to leave my life and then leaving creates more contact events uh so there's a there's a picture that they were trying to make happen, so it just looked like it happened automatically, and it was kind of by surprise. Um, but uh, so there's no practice I was doing actually, except for the aliens seem to be the ones who initiated it. So you believe that the Greys gave you the Kundalini experience by change modifying your energies so that it it rose at some point. Okay. <clears throat> So the story goes like this. The first contact event that I had, that when I'm 16, I become an orb in that contact event. So I become condensed. And uh, they, this the whole thing about it, that they're going to a space called the white room. It's this dimensional space. And then that's what they use. So uh, then, 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 so I have seven contact events before this 20-year-old Kundalini rising. And then the first contact event is this. They, they put me into a dimensional space. I become an orb. They show me a past life all in this room. This is where it all happens. This is the big picture. It all happens in this very 16-year-old contact event. And then the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and seventh are all building up to this 20-year-old experience using the white room, using this, kundalini, using this becoming an orb. So what happens when I'm 20 is that I actually have flashbacks uh, of being in that room without knowing I'd been there. And I naturally fold up or I naturally, yeah, I naturally have a, can, I have dreams and I'm an orb in, in, and I wrote them out and, and it's all part of the whole picture is that I end up kind of replicating the white room experience. So it's like there's a latent memory that I wasn't aware of. It's really the best way to frame it. So it, it's me having the Kundalini rising that they kind of helped initiate and create. Yeah. So I heard you talk about the white room previously, and I'd forgotten about that till you just brought it up again. So, um, which which of your contact experiences did you, did you um, do you think they used the white room on you every time they took you? On no, track? no, no. Just just so I experienced the room twice, only twice, and. Only once for for spiritual development, you could say. Only once for spiritual development. That's my sixteenth contact. Sorry, that's my first contact. I call it my first uh, where the relationship starts when I'm sixteen years old. So that's the that's the first contact event. So it's basically like your eighth contact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I unravel all the childhood ones together, yeah, you got it. So, um, can you describe the white room at all? Yeah, sure, definitely. So the way I frame uh, this, it's a dimensional. It's a dimensional room. So when you walk into it, um, there's no floor, there's no walls. Yeah, you're standing on something, but there's you're, there's no ceiling, and it's just a huge. It's impossibly massive how big the room is. It's because the spaceship itself wasn't as, that large. So it's this huge space, and so there's something going on with like either perception or or dimensional i don't even understand but i was in that space and then they and i was with them i was with uh the elder a gray alien and then three other gray aliens so these kind of smaller ones and then her she's about four feet tall and uh she actually steps forward and says what's about to happen is going to be beyond your comprehension and then she steps back <clears throat> and then we begin to float and there's this kind of like vibrating that occurs and I can feel, I can see my like light kind of coming out of my body. And then what, however they do it, man, I don't understand it. The body is gone. It's like they phase the body and all that's left is the core energy, the, the awareness, the, uh, the, all I can assume is the ethereal body, but then from there they collapse it. So this, and I'm not clear, this is like their quantum tech or whatever. They turn it, me into an orb and then they all get turned into orbs. And then, uh, so that is like, I, I can only like, you know, Kundalini, like the bliss, like you're having, and you're having this depth of unity that, that spreads out like your, your, uh, 
you have a a kind of like expansion of of a self identity is what it is. You're you feel you out there is what it is. You feel your spreading outwards, expanding out. And in this space is like a god thing. Like I'm there's a whole thing to be said here about what their quantum tech is, because uh, it's like you can experience God on their spaceships. And that is exactly what this was. So I had an a unity experience with their with their god nature nature god space ai i don't even fully understand it and then they were all in that space too and it's joy we were in instant joy i was in instant sameness i think another word for the sameness like i'm the same thing as them At, when i saw them they looked like crazy creatures but when you experience this energy you get that you're all just the same stuff you're i'm an energy they're an energy we're all just the same and it kind of feels like all of a sudden, they're your friends. All of a sudden, the the scariness about them absolves, and you just realize they're just the same as you. And you have this kind of like joyful. Uh, it's joyful. It's jo it's just pure joy. It's joy and it's play. All of a sudden, we started uh, moving, and uh, I was able to move in the space. <clears throat> we spun, so it kind of it put us in this like really. Uh... <coughs> Sorry, um, just need some water here put us in a raised state uh kind of the spinning and um and uh it was very blissful that's all i can say to that then from there she uh uh turns herself into a portal and i, and I didn't know that gray aliens could do that i didn't know that was a thing and it turns out other contactees have seen gray aliens turn themselves into portals and then she's like, come in. And then I basically like go into her as a portal. And that's where I see the death of my last life. Now I'm 16 years old, staring at the death of my last life. So I don't know that, um, I don't know what that, I don't, I know it's me, but I don't know it's the, I don't know he's on a Holocaust and I don't know that detail, but I'm witnessing my, uh, my past life and I can feel it. I can feel the sense of time that has passed. So I can feel it was like 70 years ago. I can feel that. And of course, I'm having this kind of intense self-awareness or self-realization and that I live on forever. I'm part of, there's a birth and death life cycle. And so it's all being exposed to me in a single instantaneous moment by witnessing a part of, witnessing the death of my last life. And they show me him going up into heaven. They're like, watch this. And then it's like, she wanted me to see this. And, uh, and then when he moves into the afterlife realm, he becomes something else that I could basically call my higher self. So like the, the, it's, it's the person, it's a part of you that volunteers to put you into the physical realm. It's the higher, uh, basically the, the multidimensional, you know, a higher self is the, I don't, there's no, we don't even have lang proper language for the stuff in our human world. And it was personified um, as a, as a, uh, as a as a man with a beard and a white gown, <clears throat> yet I could feel this kind of dimensionality that kind of extended out. And I'm convinced she actually made the image, so I could comprehend it. So I, I was like something to kind of grasp onto for the mind. And she's like she wanted me to watch it because fundamentally what ends up happening is I'm shown in this space a gray alien approach him, this higher self person thing, and what's being shown is that. There's a whole bunch of detail in the story in the book. It's pretty nuts. But the, what's being shown to me is they asked my higher self, do you want to form an agreement for, you know, the next life, this guy who will be this birth? And so they're, they're, they're asking him. They're not asking the ethereal me that lives on all the lives. They're asking the guy who's volunteering all the lives. And so they're asking at a higher level of what they're showing me. And then he says yes. And so they give me all that this detail about the building of that life. And uh, it's uh, pretty fascinating stuff, all happening in this dimensional space. Basically, it, it ends, uh, it, it was a lot, there's quite a bit of detail there, but I won't go into it. it, it basically, it ends with me, um, them showing my mom, and they're putting the spirit of me into my mom, and I'm like witnessing it all. And then, as if my mom is birthing me out, I get birthed out of the dimensional portal. I become a full body again, and I'm and I'm I'm altered. I'm altered. That 16 year old self is fully changed. And not just that; these guys are the good guys. They're the they're the guy. They're showing these other dimension. Anyway, 
there's so much there to unravel, but uh, it, it changed, it altered the relationship. All of a sudden I get that they're on my side. Um, we formed an agreement. I get it now. It all altered my identity at that point. And uh, 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 that's that. <laughs> that's the white room. It sounds totally nuts. And, and I've met other people now who've been there. So that's what's even crazier. Uh, and other, other contactees have experienced it. And we talk now. And yeah. So. <laughs> well, very few people, people talk about um, how they've made agreements with um, the greys before they. Right. To be an abductee in this life before they were born. But not too many people talk about that experience because they don't. You know, they may be given the knowledge of it, but not the details of it. Right. And that and again, you, you, so you mentioned representative, right? Like. That's something is going on here with that where you're right. I'm aware of that. I've I've heard people saying that, but then they don't have the way of proving it even or, or and, and holding that down and saying and fighting for their lives saying, no, 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 man, you can't tell me that they're the bad guys because I know that I made this agreement. But with me, they, I can do that. And they're giving me this all this big picture content, you know, past life awareness, uh, things that I I'm able to say, you can't prove it to me and I'll fight to my the death of my life that uh, this is all very much a part of the picture, that they are doing this. This is the truth, that humans do have this kind of afterlife thing going on uh, and that the aliens interacting with that and then the agreement is made to to manifest on planet Earth and there's some kind of exchange going on with them. Yeah. So describe the, the race that you're dealing with physically. Okay, so yeah, I don't have too much knowledge except for um i'm not clear what we're dealing with i'm not clear um i'm more clear that they're paranormal and dimensional than i am of any type of planet that they come from uh in fact i actually i'm i'm, re I'm rewriting and creating a new addition to the book and i'm actually making an argument that i'm not clear that even when they say they're from a planet that they are actually are because <clears throat> You know, if humans go and colonize Mars, we're there for 10,000 years. Are we still human? Are we still Earthlings? Right. And then if we are on Mars for that 10,000 years and then and then we learn to phase into another dimension and then they're there for another 10,000 years. Are you even from Mars at that point? And I think the aliens are dealing with this huge picture that they're trying to tell us with our simple minds. Oh, you're from a planet and we're from a planet. And, you know, and that we and humans are the ones who need these kind of boxed in references. And then they may give them to us. And so they told me they're from Zeta Reticuli. But, you know, I'm not clear. I'm, I'm really not. And they actually was some contradiction in, even in the information that they gave me. And I don't consider that deception. I consider it humans' frame of reference of reality is so small compared to what we're dealing with. And I, I'm proven to myself they're paranormal. So then even there, we're just dealing with dimensions and and humans don't, we don't have frames of reference. We have no, we have no language. We have no context to even put this stuff into. And so um, that's what I think we're dealing with is, is a species of possibly spacefaring aliens, but it's intertwined with dimensionality. And it just expands this picture to in a way that is, uh, might be too compre incomprehensible for humans. Um, so <clears throat> I know it's, I know it's real. I know it's genetic. Um, so there is a, there is a biological component to it as well, too. So is that alien? Um, uh, yeah, I'm assuming it's alien, but I just don't have the bigger picture. And, uh, and I, every time I learn more about it, it seems to actually go staggeringly farther than I thought it would ever go. Uh, like for example, I'm clearly dealing with a mantis type species. I call him the leader. Um, so then, you know, what, what's his picture in this? And he clearly seems to be running the show. So, uh, so is it even about gray aliens at that point? Is it about this species then? And then who are they? And we don't have that much information about them actually. So uh, it's so big picture. I think that's what's going on here that uh, we have pieces of a puzzle that are, and actually bottom line, I keep saying that this isn't even about aliens because everything that they're showing me is about humans. That humans are the ones who are, uh, you know, we don't know about our interdimensionality and we don't know about our abilities and we don't know about our even our own origin story. And they seem to be all kind of connected to this larger picture about uh, about it all. And so they've given me, yeah, they told me they're from Zeta Reticuli, but it seems to be such a small piece of the puzzle. And uh, so you snuck up with snuck up on me with the mantis thing. 
Yeah. Uh, so uh, you've just now gotten past your past life stuff, your childhood stuff, your 16 year old thing. Now, how yeah. many? That's eight out of 26. So that means you've got uh, 20, 19, 18 no, wait, wait, wait. more. You got 18 you've, more stories to go through. No, you've you've added the childhood. So I didn't, right? When I say 26 contact events, I'm not adding the childhood. Oh, that's, that's 26 without the childhood. Yeah, it's 26 without the childhood. Okay, yeah. so you've gone through one of 26. So yeah. you got 25 to go. You don't have a lot of time to go through 25. Yeah, I could summarize. Let's see if I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want summaries. We want all the details. All the, all the gory details. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, you can, yeah, I mean. Read the book, yes, I know. No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm saying uh, ask me anything you want, yeah. I can well, give you. Go through, go, just go to the next experience. Sure. <clears throat> so they were following a timeline. They showed me, um, this again, like, when I talk about disclosure, like, aliens can see the future. So, uh, and what that future is, I think maybe is malleable, but they showed me a timeline. There's, this is what we'll, we'll be working with you from here to here. And they were very aware of the consciousness event when it would happen. And they showed me, they showed it to me. And uh, and the only way any of this stuff makes sense is that they could see the future. So as nutty as that, that is. Um, Stop. Go ahead. Consciousness event? The, uh, the Kundalini rising. Kundalini. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So the genetic activation, Kundalini rising thing, I call it the consciousness event. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead yeah. with your next experience. Yeah, so so now, so the 16-year-old event was before the timeline. So they're like, it's kind of like pre-timeline. Now they're like saying, here's a timeline of all the stuff we're going to work with you in. And it starts in 1995. So I have a brief meeting with an alien in the forest. It's totally, and it's very brief. It's basically saying, we're coming. But, you know, like, we're, we're, like we want you to know that we're here. And it actually... Uh, uh, all the memories of the white room like flooded me and I'm altered in the forest very briefly before he seals up the memory. It's really weird that he did that actually. <clears throat> so that's very brief meeting with an alien in the forest. Literally just in, like no craft, no nothing. Just, just an, I got lured out actually too. So it was like a telepathic. So when you say alien in the forest, do you mean another gray? Short gray? Like, yeah, yeah. Gray? Very short, like three foot tall gray alien. Yeah. So describe somebody. Describe and a gray that you know i'm not certain yeah no, it's yeah. got somebody give, give me a description as, uh, of, of one of the aliens at least. yeah well i can describe um the elder so uh the elder the elder was the main great alien i dealt with <clears throat> so she had um downward uh i actually pictures are online and stuff somewhere um she has downward uh oval type eyes and so so like downward like that and then they're yeah but they're like a it's not oval is not the right word yeah, kind of oval and they're they're 3d like they pop out actually a little bit <clears throat> and they're highly black and reflective um like a tv screen is basically what i say i'm convinced they have silicone in them actually because of how reflective their eyes are uh she had cheekbones so she has a very uh thin thin mouth like the typical thin mouth thin nose but she has these cheekbones so she has so it's like this kind of face that kind of comes in and then a deep chin uh, so it's a really crazy face, and uh, and then she has a cur like a, an elongated cone that goes back, and uh, it all felt kind of like regal actually. Her 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 vibe was kind of regal, like she was some kind of leader in her society or something. I don't fully understand. So have you read Elena Denon's book? Uh, uh, the, no, I know of her. I don't. I have not read any of her content. <clears throat> Hold on one second. All right, so first thing I need to do is this right here. Whoops, no, that's, did I just, what did you do? Uh, I just messed up. <laughs> I can't see you anymore, let's see. No background. Okay. All right. So, um, I've lost your video. Why? I clicked on something and you went away. Still here though. 
I can see you. Uh, yeah. <coughs> All right, there you go. Allow incoming video. That's the button I have to hit. So here's her book. Uh, right, I've heard of this. Yeah, yeah. A gift from the stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Alien races. Yeah. And I'll let it on. Okay, so the only reason I mention it is because um, what I was thinking was that if you were to buy a copy of it or you know, find somebody that you know that has a copy, either way, uh, and look through it and see if you can find your race. That way, um, that way, you know, I'm not saying her book is even true. It may be true, it may not be. But if it is, and you find your race in there, uh, then, you know, you'll have um, some more information about right. that race. <clears throat> so, um, right. go continue going through the next event that you were about to describe that I could sure. show. So let me, uh, let me see if I can... <clears throat> summarize things I, I do actually agree that we should i should summarize so let's let's see how i can do here so my third contact event happened in 1996 october and i'm told there that's the that's where i'm told uh you know that they involved themselves with biological human biological development uh and for me it was actually tens of thousands of years ago that's kind of how she impressions it um but I'm so sold by them. I'm so, I'm actually, I would consider, I drank the Kool-Aid. I was a teenager and I was in love with these guys. I was like, you know, they're, they gave me the white room. I was altered by it. I've been, so whenever they've opened up the memories, I was this lover of them. I was like, oh my God, I was all really excited. And, and, uh, and I was a teenager. So I was soaked into everything they had to offer me. So I heard this information and I wasn't really that phased by it. And it turned out to be very relevant uh, many years later because they do add on to this picture. Um, the fourth contact event. Um, so is the year 1997 where all the kind of more spiritual development started occurring. And also the the 20 me who doesn't know I'm having alien contact is starting to experience psychic abilities and starting to have premonitions and things that go real. So I'm, I'm believing I'm learning about spirituality and believing this stuff. And it's all kind of reflected based off of the contact events. They it was weird uh, interconnections going on here. <clears throat> so I have a fourth contact event in 1997. And uh, um, basically, I smoked pot, <laughs> and the aliens didn't like it because it could interfere with our agreement. And so they, we had a contact event, and they kind of scolded me actually. And I saw my brain on a hologram device. Uh, she tries to actually show me the origin of the of the reason why I, I smoke pot, and it it she shows me <clears throat> on a device my thoughts. Like, and it's like I'm, I'm cupped into a machine and she's showing me this device and I can see all my thoughts. Literally, if my thoughts are like little pieces of floating data packets is basically what I call them. Not not like TV imagery, but so like little squiggly forms. And she's showing me I have this kind of like uh, <clears throat> my mom had depression when I was a young child. I actually remember it three or three or four or something. Anyway, you don't think it affects you, but, you know, she's showing me that this was impacting uh the kind of like isolation i experienced that at that as a child was impacting all these upper thoughts she's trying to heal this uh desire i have to smoke pot and it's very fascinating and uh, it does actually like eventually over months it does work like i eventually quit and and so it's really interesting how that all happens that's my fourth contact event so they're trying to develop me here uh my fifth contact event also happens in 1997 and that's where they either do energy work i have this kind of like uh, body grid stuff happened that does seem very related to the Kundalini type event. Like it seems very energy related, what happens. <clears throat> uh, I have, uh, that's a fifth contact event. The sixth contact event, also energy work where there's some kind of mag, they do, they're doing something with the magnetic fields <clears throat> and I'm with a friend when that happens. And, and it does seem like they freeze time because he's caught in, in, in a moment. His eyes are open and they just stay open. And then I'm taken into a craft and it really does seem like they freeze time. I, uh, Preston Denning is pretty convinced uh, from all the research now, out now that that's what they can do. They can freeze time. And I'm pretty certain something like that happened there. Uh, and then the seventh contact event right before the Kundalini Rising event thing would happen to me. So like a month or a couple of weeks before, 
that's when she's like, it's okay, we are, we're set to you know, do this thing with you. And she shows me a galactic federation that they're very interested in this. What's what we're doing, this experiment, this experiment we're doing. But then here's the, the twist is that she gets me into her, she does this thing with her eye. She can do these like kind of lights and stuff can come out of her eye. And she's basically like, hey, when this is done, we need your semen. <laughs> so it's like, ah, I was like really kind of put uh, taken aback by that at, at that very moment. And, uh, but they have a way of kind of obscuring the memories. So what's really obvious is that they do this kind of this consciousness raising event. And then my biology becomes very valuable to them. And, uh, and so that's, that's, that's all the contact events that happened before that consciousness event. Then the consciousness event makes me leave to go traveling. Hold, hold and, on, stop yeah, for a second. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so after they raised your consciousness, that's the first time they took your semen? Yes, that's right. That's and right. so you believe, based on your experience, that uh, that uh, your semen became valuable because of the way they changed your body yeah yeah with that is exactly consciousness it. yeah and though it's funny enough yeah they don't explain it to that detail the entire year after that consciousness event is all biology yeah oh okay well don't let me uh distract you keep keep going sure you're, on a, you're in a flow so yeah yeah you got it good thing uh so the most amount of contact events i have in all my life and like sorry like, and the most amount in a single year happened in the year 1998 the year after that consciousness event. So it's practically every month. And every time they're wanting stuff from me, they're taking, they're taking, um, but they're also giving. So they end up, they end up for them, it's big picture. And at the time I'm not aware of that. Um, so again, that, that representative thing, as you kind of mentioned, uh, they started telling me details. <clears throat> so first off, the eighth contact event, the first one after the biologic, after the Kundalini rising, I'm traveling now. And it's the first time I see a UFO uh, as me, as uh, as the guy who doesn't know he's having alien contact. Uh, so it's really wild how they did it. Right? They just keep it all secret. They cover it all up. They don't want you to know when they don't want you to know. And when they when you know, they want you to know. So I'm um, that says a lot to me about the way some people's contact events happen. Um, uh, so I uh, it's the first time they're uh, it's like they're rewarding me, actually, for having done the 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 build up they're saying thank you for doing this with us and like even that was something that they got out of like they were studying a human uh, just building up the to the consciousness event the first seven contact events and then they reward me and they say they take me up to a, a base in space and they say where do you want to go what do you want to do what do you want from us we're grateful and that's why i say i want to see where you live I, like i i don't know anything about you i want to see where you live and so she shows me and they well she the elder lives on venus and there's a city on venus and I now have met other people who've been to a city on Venus. I've actually, uh, some, of, some of them are like credible, well-known abductees. And I won't mention until they're ready to talk about that. But uh, they've also been on the cities on Venus. And I'm, it's like, you know, these are like dimensionally phased cities or something. And then you're in a different state with them. And so you're able to be on these, in these cities. I don't understand it. Uh, and I go to, uh, it's, it's populated. Like there's alien species. And we're, you're kind of there. And I went and saw where a humanoid, a humanoid was there. So I met, interacted with a, a human looking alien and I saw where he lived. And then I saw where the elder lived and they live in like condos, like not, but the buildings, the environment is highly different. The, the, uh, it's like, like, so I, I say their con their crafts are alive. Like they feel very alive and the city felt alive. The city feel, feels like it has consciousness. It's really uh, wild. And, um, that's a whole experience. That's my eighth contact event. <clears throat> and then. So stop for a second. So yeah, yeah. Uh, do you need a break? I probably would grab more water, but I can actually. Okay, well, let, let me take a break. You grab some water and uh, hold that thought. And I do have a question. Sure. We'll meet, up, we'll meet up in like one minute. Okay, sounds good. All right.
Oh, man. Uh, what did I do? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I needed that. Um, I forgot what my question was, so go ahead and carry on with your, uh, with where you were going with the story. Yeah, I was on Venus. I don't know if that was some time. Oh, yeah, I re maybe I do remember now. You're, you're, um, I guess the only thing, uh, question I have would be, uh, if you could describe, uh, Venus to the best, you know, as much detail as you can. That's about sure. That. Um, so when I saw it, uh, I was on a, I was in the, I was driving the craft. Actually, they gave me uh, the opportunity to drive the craft. I didn't know how common that is. Actually, it's uh, Grant Cameron, the researcher, says he knows 50 people who've driven crafts. Uh, so um, again, I use that as an one of the arguments I use for that the aliens are actually benevolent because they're letting you use their technology. Um, so I drew the, I flew the craft, a UFO, a disc-shaped UFO. I flew it out from Earth, from outside in space, uh, from uh, outside the atmosphere, from Earth to Venus. And then he took over, my the fellow humanoid who was with me, and it was white. Basically, it was, uh, I said it looked like a snowball, actually. It was not as the, I think we think we has more brown or something in the pictures or something, and I'm not clear. Uh, it was white, and then as we flew in, uh, uh, a thick atmosphere. So it became like muddy, muddy, uh, like white, then muddy, and then like muddy brown, like, like uh, yeah, muddy brown, basically. And then we uh, it kind of ejected out and uh, the clouds, and it was a dead planet. <laughs> it looks like a, uh, a, a, basically like a hell is how I kind of framed it, um, with lots of clouds and, uh, and, Anyway, when I get out, the whole point is I can see it from the, all these rocks and I see the city. Then we land and that's when he opens the door and I'm like, can we breathe this air? And he's all nonchalant. Oh, you know, the air is normal is what he says. Uh, we get out and uh, and I'm able to not, you know, there's no, that's why I'm convinced we're phased because I'm not affected by the atmosphere. Um, and it looked, it looked acidic. And there was something where, uh, as I kind of frame it, like, like there was like, uh, moisture or something coming off of the rocks and they're like steaming or something and there's clouds moving through the the uh the city so there was a thick atmosphere the uh the orange basically orange yellow was the like uh the, the sky and uh it was just a dead planet it's like rocks big thick rocks and landscape of rocks and the city was kind of I was kind of framing it. It's almost like it was floating a little bit, a couple feet even, just off the off the uh, off the surface. And then that was it. We go into the city, and the city was almost self-contained, uh, where uh, there was lots of windows, but then we're in this. So it wasn't like an open city like on Earth. We have all these open cities. It was like we went into a structure, and the structure was tied to all these buildings. And then we were inside. And so then we were kind of surrounded by uh, all the, the technology. So it wasn't like an open city like you'd have out here on Earth. Um, and then that's why I, I, there were courtyards and there were lots of aliens moving. And uh, uh, and so that's the gist of it. Is that what you mean? Well, yeah, so that's fine. Uh, so then back up and describe driving the craft. Sure. Um, so I had a synchron. I had a... Uh, cooperation with this um so uh, again they're rewarding me right so this was the contact event that they're kind of they're kind of make me feel good so um they are so i ask if i can go to venus no i, no, I say uh i asked 
I ask her, I want to know where you live. And she says, we live on Venus. And then she's taking me there. And when she's, she's taking me to the, the hangar where the, the crafts are, she's communicating with someone. I can see her, I can feel like they can feel them. And I can feel her communicating with someone. And then a humanoid uh, meets us at the head door of the hangar bay. And so it's me, a gray alien and, and a humanoid. And it's the first time I'm witnessing uh, telepathy between two aliens actually uh, not, i've seen it before but not so clearly and she's asking him hey do you want to show him where we live and he's like looking at me he's all jovial and he's like yes yeah yes he's like really excited to do that so then we leave her and it's me and him and the humanoid and we walk into a hangar and there's crafts all over the, this hangar uh, um, uh <clears throat> not everything lots of discs but uh, strange shapes and also tubes. And there were like strange uh, tubes with like nose cones and stuff. Uh, there's a door open on one of them. And he basically like, we just kind of walk into this one. Um, and I sit down in the craft. It's a, uh, <clears throat> maybe I'm just trying to think of the diameter or like the space the setting of the space. Sure. Maybe like this is my, my bedroom here is maybe 10, 10 feet. Uh, so maybe something like that, 10 or 15 feet, uh, like big inside the space. And, and I sit down on a chair that's kind of up against the wall and he's like, no, 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 you're going to drive. So everything's in telepathy and, uh, and I'm, I'm already feeling like super over, uh, ex you know, exhilarated by going to Venus, by having this experience that I'm driving the craft. I think it's insane. So he puts his hands on these pads that actually is a mold. So it's actually molded to to uh <clears throat> i don't know if it's specifically him but it was actually five fingers and and uh, and a thumb uh or four fingers and a thumb and it's this metal pad and so it's got this bar and he puts his hands onto it and and on the screen basically i can see the craft is moving and then it jacks out uh and it, i'm pretty convinced it was going through the walls of the space base that we were in and then we're just floating there and that's when he sets me up so we're floating in space and then he's like, you put your hands here and you think about where you want to go. And he really is, it's so basic and simple, like he, his instruction. Uh, and it really, once you do it, you can kind of feel it as well, too. You can actually, uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> there's kind of a sense of, of your expanded awareness is what it is. Like you can kind of feel, once you put your hands on this thing, you can kind of feel the edge of the craft, if you will, the kind of the, the feeling of the of the environment, of the, of the, of the object you're attached to. And... And then he's like, you know, you just look at a spot on on the on the screen, and you like, and then you think to go there. And so, um, <clears throat> I'm actually kind of convinced too, uh, without any explanation, that the crap that the screen knew where I was looking, and there's something about it. <laughs> so uh, when I look and I push it forward, or like I, I project it forward, it's instantaneous. So it's like it goes, it's like a shot. But, but it's not. It's not me flying like this. It's an instantaneous shot. And then I keep aligning it. Realign and basically he explained where Venus was. So I know generally where to be going. And Venus, uh, I got right, by the way, too, like in these memories, uh, where Venus was and where Earth was in the, in the solar system. And for me, I drew it and I filmed myself drawing it. Uh, and then learned on the internet uh, through whatever, you know, there's websites for this stuff, uh, where Venus was. And I got bang on. It's the the actual angle of where Earth was and the angle of where Venus was. Uh, so, you know, these are real memories, right? And not just that, I have a cooperation for flying a craft out in space. Uh, apparently, when you have these type of gravity devices, Linda Moulton Howell has a really interesting, fascinating, you know, article on our um, video uh, when she's dealing with a physicist. And yes, a craft would instantaneously envelop space. Uh, when it's out in space, it would actually fly instantaneously from spot A to B, as opposed to drifting and flying. And and that's exactly what happens here. I, it's it's a shot. So, but we go move to one spot. I angle the craft. I look at another spot between Earth and Venus, and then I shoot there. And that happens like four times. Like uh, four times I do that. And then then by the end, Venus is kind of a big white ball on the on the screen. And uh, and the and I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> I don't want to like do the wrong thing with this technology. And so he takes over and then he flies us into the, the atmosphere. And so he's the one who kind of uh, coasts it through. And then I'm watching on the screen as it's going through the thick atmosphere and then pops out over the landscape. Yeah. So what, what type of craft was it you flew? What shape was it? This was a disc. This was a, this was a UFO. This was a disc. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, okay. So which, of all your encounters, which one did they let you fly out the disc on? 
this is sorry which number you know you this is the eighth this is my eighth i fly eighth crash from the age of eight uh, i'm i'm uh 20 or 20 i'm 20 at this time yeah 20. 20 so within two years you had eight eight event eight encounters two years within two years well you said you didn't <clears throat> count your childhood event. from 16. oh from 16. Yeah, 16, so now I'm 20, it's four years. Oh, four yeah, years. Have, yeah, so four years, four I've, years had, I've had eight contact events. Eight, eight encounters in four years. That's right, yeah. Okay, yeah. so go ahead, and uh, so this was like your fourth adult encounter. Oh, being 20, or is that what you mean? Or, or No, your eighth, I'm sorry, your eighth. Yeah, my eighth. Yeah, your eighth I mean. adult encounter, you, they let you drive on your eighth encounter. <laughs> adult yeah, encounter. Right. Yeah, yeah, they're like he's passed the license, I guess. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how they thought about it, but so uh, okay, so keep going through your encounters as much yeah. detail as you'd like to go. Sure. Um, the ninth contact event is, is biological. It happens out in nature somewhere. Not too much to tell there. Um, the tenth is so it's we're mid mid nineteen ninety eight. We're July nineteen ninety eight. <clears throat> And uh, this is where they want to start telling you information. Like they set it up. They set up the contact event. They want to tell me information. That's kind of how it's laid out here. Basically, I see a dead, I, I get taken into a craft and uh, I'm in Northern Saskatchewan. I'm isolating myself and he's crazy. I'm traveling. I'm, I'm, I've, you know, I've, I've abandoned society. So I'm, I'm isolating myself constantly. And every time I do, there's a contact event at the end of it. It's really weird how that all kind of unravels itself. And um, and so I'm taken into a craft, and there is a dead cow on the craft. I there's dead humans on the craft, and I get terrified actually. And I'm like, "What are you doing?" And they're saying, "We're making the new human." And and I'm I'm like, "What are you doing with these people who are dead?" And they're like, "Oh, well, we asked their permission. They allowed us to use their bodies." And I eventually like the bodies looked. They looked. They had been. Uh, like a morgue, like they had been dead, actually taken from graves, actually, because they looked like they were dead people. They looked like they were, they were, uh, their skins looked leathery and, and, and then they took the body from graves, basically, like, uh, exhumed. That's what it looked like. They looked like they were exhumed. And, uh, and especially with the dead cow, I have, uh, I just did a video series with Ian Howling from, uh, Linda Mollenhau's, uh, Earth Files. And, um, the cooperation that, North and Saskatchewan has tons of cattle mutilations. And the idea that I'm on a craft, that's where my contact event happens, where I'm on a craft with a dead cow. That's just really, really fascinating synchronicity or cooperation. Anyway, the new human. So they say they're going to, we're making the new human. I'm kind of weirded out by seeing all these dead people and things. And then we go into the basement area of this huge, huge factory. That's what it feels like. And in there, he shows me all these hybrids and says, see, we're making the new human. And they're basically great alien human hybrids. And um, the gist of the story is that he shows me a consciousness hologram. And on this hologram is the planet Earth. And then he, uh, it's basically giving me part imparting information. These holograms, they're like, they're, they really are devices for your soul. They're not, it's not just your brain. There's something a lot larger where they kind of, they know how to impart the information properly. And, um, so I could feel everything that this this hologram generated, and it is a planet Earth. Then the Earth is getting strained, and there's like there's a, a land is being eroded from the Earth. Actually, like but something's like taking a bite. Like you take a bite out of an apple, like crunches were being taken out of the land, and all this strain was occurring on the on the planet. And then it, it basically snapped and went into flames. Like it's kind of went to a point and then burned up. Started all these flames started to engulf the planet. And then it got taken over, or sorry, like recreated, like that, 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 and it was a whole other change of vibration. It was a new feel, and it was obvious. The way I frame it in the book is the gray mind will dominate, um, but you know that this is alien. An open alien presence is the better way to frame that. An open alien presence on planet Earth, and not just that. The aliens are not. This is not Star Trek, and this is not Star Wars. These are interdimensionality, and so it changes the vibration, changes the whole feel of everything. And uh, and it's basically the planet would have to, we would have to alter ourselves to adapt to this new kind of dimensionality that they would bring. And they show it to me on this planet Earth. And in this, so <clears throat> the center of the, of, the, of the hologram was North America. And then in the center of North America was a huge city. Uh, I basically would call it a thousand kilometer diameter circle city placed right in the center of North America. 
And I now learn that that's a synchronicity with, uh, <clears throat> uh, I don't know if you've seen Paul, uh, uh, David Polite's new documentary, Missing 4 and one the UFO Connection. But he points out that in Central America, in the central of North America, is a huge water reservoir. And there is a, a <clears throat> there's a alien interest in that area. And, uh, and and there's a he relates a contact event of someone being told to dig a well. The aliens told him to dig a well, and it turned out there was a huge water reservoir underneath Central America, North Central North America. And this is exactly what I saw. I matched my contact event that there's a big city placed right in Central of North America. And uh, so that was the gist of that hologram. I was basically being shown humans cause all this problem. And uh, sorry. With that was this whole feeling of celebration of nature was saved. So there was, it's showing the motivation of the aliens, the gray aliens motivation, uh, uh, also for the hybrid program that there, there was this, you know, humans are gonna be the ones to cause this strain on the planet and this problem. Then uh, there's this kind of uh, agenda or motivation, uh, if you will, to save it. And that's really, that's what this hologram was all about, basically showing me that they were uh, completely interested in trying to preserve the planet. And did you get any? Have you since that time ever um, gotten any information that gave you the um, the cause, possible cause of po that possible event? Uh, okay, yes. So yeah, they build off of this over time, over the contact events. It's like they're giving oh, okay. me. All right. Yeah, they're giving. It's. You know, the, the way they do it, they understand the human psyche. Like, they can't overwhelm, and yet they need to break the mind at the same time. So uh, so they give me this picture. Is It happens in 1998, and they will build off, build off of it. It's actually really wild how they do this. Um, but in this contact event, they're showing me the kind of strain of the planet, these kind of issues. And then they really explain that they've been at this, interacting with humans for centuries. And they give up a big, big, big picture. And they basically say... They, the, they really zero in on a, the nuclear weapons was the last opportunity humans had to try and change things. It wasn't, we always kind of had this mind frame that that's the beginning of it all. And, and they're saying, at least with me, they said that was the end of it all actually. Uh, and they gave, they basically mentioned Nazis that they, they try to, at every step they're kind of trying to say humans, you need to be aware that you're going down this path. And if you do, you know, we have to involve ourselves. And, and that's really what they were kind of saying is that, there's this big, big picture. And even when I, they said that basically it started in the 1600s. And when you look at UFO abduction content, there actually is, a, I found the Boston Times from the 1650s or something has an abduction event. Though they didn't know, understand it as abduction at the time, uh, someone has missing time. And uh, so, I, I mean, I don't know what to think about that, but that's how they frame the information to me. And, uh, uh, and so they're saying big picture here that there's a kind of also the human mind has uh, a tendency for for kind of a self-interest and that that in self-interest is is now permeating the entire you know social structure and you can't change it and it needs to that needs to change fundamentally to help you move over to this new era and so that's why we're introducing alien genetics these genetics into the the picture that's kind of how they frame it they also show me that um that uh, so I experienced God on their ships with the white room. Remember the 16th contact, my, my first contact event when I was 16. So they're show, they're making the connection that that God thing is actually very much in line with, uh, this whole event. And so they're kind of like showing me that, like, it's a very spiritual event, basically is how it is. Like as terrifying as it looks with hybrids and, and the idea that aliens are going to come and be on the planet, uh, and how, you know, humans tendency to, I think that means we're all going to be controlled by them and all these kind of negative things. They're showing me that actually it's a very, there's a higher thing going on that's very required, uh, very spiritual actually. And uh, so it all becomes part of the big picture of, of my 10th contact event. They lay off that type of stuff. The contact events continue to be biological and there, I have my 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, all biological, all happening in 1998. The 16th, I'm sick of the biology. I want them out of my life. They actually overdid it with me. I'm like, done. I want you out. I'm fighting with them, actually. I get to the point where, so I went, I was loving them. Then I hated them. I went from loving them to hating them. And I wanted them out of my life. And then they, the 16th contact event was them rectifying everything, saying, listen, they showed me the the, the timelines. I mean, it's a, it's a very detailed story, but 
they showed me how my higher self actually agreed to all this. They went back to that, how they showed me that stuff in the first contact event. They brought it all back up again and they showed it to me. And I actually could feel in my heart, holy shit, my higher self did agree to all this stuff. I could feel it. And it made sense in the larger picture about how everything had unfolded at that time. And so, uh, and they said it ends actually, the biology stuff ends and, and you, and you know, you agreed to this is basically a part of you agreed to it. And I could feel all that. And anyway, there's, there is bigger picture stuff there. It's part of the book. It's hard to kind of go into it all, but I confirmed for myself that that actually is true, that my, there was an exchange going on between my higher self. So, uh, you, you give you this enlightenment experience type thing, and then we will use your biology. And, you know, it's like for them, Graylians, it's like a, an exchange and an evolution exchange and that they are very okay to give you this evolution as long as we can get something from it too. So that's kind of like the bigger picture of it. And and I, I would agree with that. I actually agree that my higher self agreed to that. But at the time, I didn't know that. So the story is really nutty where I'm fighting with them. Um, and all the biology ends, 1998. So it only happens for one single year. Then 1999, it's like they let off, actually, the contact events really let off. And I have only four, uh, no, uh, so sorry, 17, 18, 19. So 17, and my 17th, 18th, 19th contact event happened in 1999. They're spread out over, you know, long periods of time there. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's just too much detail there, but uh, it's really... Um, they're trying to help me while I'm traveling. Let's put, let's put it that way. Uh, 17, 18, 19th, my 20th, 21st, and 22nd happened in the year 2000. And at this point, they're trying to help me. They're trying to align me to get stop traveling. And they, they, uh, like they know my future. And they know how to get me out from traveling. And I'm supposed to meet my now. She'll be my wife. She's my wife now. The woman I meet traveling. So I meet her traveling. It's a beautiful love story. Turned out the aliens were actually the ones putting us together. <laughs> and I didn't know that. I won't know that until 20 years later. Uh, and But I'll have what we'll see UFOs. Me and my wife saw a UFO the, the night we met. And, uh, uh, and and I feel an angel is telling me I'm going to meet a woman the very next, the very day before I meet her. Uh, so they're, it's very much involved. It all becomes part of our story, uh, we're, we're like this love story between us. Uh, but it turned out it was them. And I, I won't learn that about that for 20 years, but they're the whole year 2000 is us is them really aligning that. So their contact events uh, uh, are really them anyway. It's hard to go into the detail, but they really align that period of my life. So again, that's all this big picture stuff that they have that they see. And I'm just a vessel and I'm not aware fighting with them, getting mad at them. It's drama. By the end, I'm pissed off with them. I'm, I'm like dramatic with them. And uh, and and it's really kind of comical. Um Traveling ends, and then there's one last contact event, the 23rd, that caps off the entire story up to that point. So it's like they really did create a whole big picture. Uh, and in that 23rd is when I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm done traveling, and I realize, oh, my God, they knew I'd stop traveling. Oh, my God, they knew I'd meet my wife. They knew I'd meet a guru because my wife was following the guru at the time. They knew the, they understood the whole big picture. They understood it all, and I, that's why I kind of – was like, oh, wait a minute. They and they were saying things. They were hinting at it, but they wouldn't tell me. Um, so that showed me that they actually their abilities are far grander and uh, uh, much more than humans can even begin to comprehend. And so that it's a really fascinating big picture stuff here. Um, in that twenty third contact event is when they actually explained that uh, they actually had gray alien hybrids in the planets a long time ago. And we are just the descendants of this type of genetic line. And and then they were very interested in dealing with these genetics and combining them with present day gray alien hybrids. And that's kind of what makes the the me and the bunch of humans that, that I met on the craft. Uh, uh, that's the gist of that. The planet stuff starts unraveling in the adult years. So I have seven years later, I have another contact of a seven year huge gap after this 23rd contact event after the traveling period seven years later in the year 2008 i have a contact event <clears throat> and um so this is when they start showing me that the planet stuff and uh so i'm shown great waves uh to simplify i, sh I was I had one contact event in the in that in the, it's the 18th contact event in the year 1999 and i'm shown great waves then and i don't understand what it means and and so here in 2008, 10 years later from that contact event, she's actually 
putting the pieces together and saying this great waves you're going to see is tied to this something changing in the in the magnetic field and um and i i really zero in on the schumann residence they showed me i didn't know the most the craziest part about it having being an alien contactee is getting information scientifically about something that you have no knowledge about uh, and then after the, when, the Amer when you have the memories and you're putting it all together, you realize, wait a minute, they were showing me something that was legitimate. Uh, so they showed me the Schumann residence, which is the circle of the electromag the low band electromagnetic frequency that hovers uh, over top of the planet. And something along the Schumann residence would change. And they were showing me a shift in the actual pole, like an actual something in the core would shift. It would actually buckle land and the land would actually sh would create these great waves. And we're talking like, thousand kilometers inland type gravities. Yeah, they could be talking about the pole shift. A lot of people start have started talking about that recently. So it wasn't the thing is it wasn't and I, I just I have to speak as clearly to the holograms and everything I got. It wasn't a flip. And there is actually a histor a uh, one of these kind of like, you know, um historian guys, uh, some of them kind of Graham, Graham Hancock kind of guy. I can't remember his name. This other guy. And he had a theory that the pole actually adjusts. And that's what this kind of more was. And then in the adjustment, the actual planet itself moves while the core stays still. And then that creates an actual tidal wave. And he was explaining how he believes that that's happened before. And, and I was like, wait a minute, that's kind of matching what the gray aliens showed me, that there was kind of an adjustment going on. And then the adjustment would create a kind of a tidal wave type effect. And then after that is when the cities get placed and the whole arrangement and the change happens. And uh, then there's the 25th contact event, which is when she says, uh, that's 2016. She says, your memories are open now. And uh, uh, the memories are open. We want you to write a book. And that's when I understood there was a bigger picture. And then the 2017th contact event was me struggling with all of that memories coming out and having trouble and they were trying to help. And, uh, and that's the last time I had a physical contact event with them. That's it. So you never brought the mantis in or the mantid. Do you call him mantid or mantis? I actually don't call him a mantis. Um, cause my guy didn't look like an insect. He, though he had some of the similar characteristics that other contactees talk about, but my guy did not look like a bug. He didn't, he was more of an aardvark is actually what I kind of frame it as, but he had, he's, he held himself like this, the way that some of the contactees describe the mantis, like holding its arms out like a mantis would. And my guy did that and he had claws and his eyes are on the side of his head, much like the mantis people describe. He had cat-like eyes, like much like the mantis people describe. But my guy didn't look like a bug. He had a snout, actually. He had a kind of larger, like a horse-looking face, actually. I see, I, okay, I was interacting with him without knowing I was in, in the biological contact events. He'd obscured his, his, uh, his presence, so I didn't know it was him, but I knew an essence or a presence was behind this wall, and I couldn't see it. Couldn't see him, I mean. And then the 23rd contact event, at the end of the traveling, is when he reveals himself. And uh, and so he, and he ends up being saying, I am the leader of this program. Like the thing we did was an actual big, 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 big picture program that he had been planning. Uh, and that's the picture that I eventually end up getting. And he's the one to say that. He also, it gets crazy. He's like, you were my children. And, uh, and, and it's like, all of a sudden you recognize like, wait a minute, like that's how they think of us. They kind of think of us as this big picture. Like we're, it's almost emotional for them. Uh, if they have emotions, but it's more, it's not emotional, but it's more uh, very touchy feely. Let's put it that way. And, uh, and yeah, so I meet him there. Basically he's the one saying this was all me basically. And then I have the last contact event, the 2017 is me interacting with him directly. And, uh, and he is, um, he's anyway, something paranormal happens to me in my life in 2017 and he's responsible for it. And I didn't know that. And I eventually learned when the memories come out. <clears throat> Uh, I don't have any other big picture about him because he doesn't reveal that much more else to me about him, uh, except for that he was the running, the guy who controlled the program and, and he worked with the elder, the aliens that I kind of, you know, involved myself with. So, so you, um, if the bulk of your contact is with Grays, but then at the end you realize that 
the mantids are running the greys, or, or that is, the agenda was for the mantids, and the alien, the greys are basically fulfilling the agenda for the mantids. Yeah. So the way I frame it is, um, I'm pretty certain there's a symbiosis thing going on here. It's like a, uh, like you get something, we get something. So, uh, <clears throat> cause most people talk about gray aliens in this very robotic type way. And yes, I experienced them to be detached and very removed, but they also had personalities. They were themselves. They were, they were their own people like, like anybody would be. And then they form bondings and agreements a hundred percent. And then, so there was this bonding that occurred between them. So yeah, they were, so there's there's something larger that they get out of each other that I'm guess I'm not aware of. Um, but yeah, you're right. In the end, when it comes to the, all this planet content, it really did end up kind of seeming like, well, no, I actually wouldn't even say it seems it is. It's the, it's, it's them. It's the, it's these mantis type creatures that are, that seem to be a uh, big picture about it all. And I'm actually, I, I call them the gurus of the galaxy because I think that, I think we're dealing with just other dimensions and that I'm even convinced the alien I saw wasn't even its physical form or that wasn't even his true form. Like he's an avatar. He's like, that's the, that's the form he uses when he's interacting with physical dense creatures. Um, I think we're doing, and I think when it comes to everything, I think when it comes to the big picture stuff of humans were made by aliens, I think we're going to learn it was actually these guys. I think, uh, that's what I think. I think all the big picture stuff is them. And I think they play a larger. The way I understand it is very. It's it's a it's a service role to the you know the unified field. When I asked why do you in uh, in one of the contact events I'm traveling, I ask I asked about the semen. Why are you taking semen? What's that all about? And they said because the universe desires to be born. And so they like, and so they basically, he gave me an image of solar systems. Like they actually seed solar systems and they do it because they feel like they're servicing, like they're actually creating life and they love to create life. And they're actually, you know, uh, they do it because the universe wants to be born. Uh, so they're like, they're, they have this kind of higher philosophy, if you will, but it's not even philosophy for them. I'm, I'm aware that they understand these kind of, uh, truths about these these things and uh so for whatever reason the mantis obviously a big picture i'm convinced is part of that so so the mantis and the greys work together and the end result is um more life more variety more everything everywhere and it's a positive it, you, you look at it all as a positive thing uh, uh, yeah, I do actually. I, I do. I think I think the challenges are actually the human created ones. <laughs> I think those are the big picture uh, challenges. But um, uh, no, one hundred percent for me, it's uh, well. They they demonstrate that's the problem. They've demonstrated so much of that higher that higher awareness that for me, it's without a doubt that that is what's going on. That they're 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 big picture, and in that big picture, they're very nature. They're very uh, kind and they're very actually loving uh, in the process. And uh, yeah, so I do see it as positive. Yeah. So are you a Doctor Who fan? <laughs> no, I uh, know. Uh, I like sci-fi, but I've never gotten into Doctor Who, unfortunately. It's the lowest budget sci-fi series ever made. Right. Maybe that's why. <laughs> uh, uh, well, it's if you're into cheesy stuff, <laughs> it was the early, early days. I mean, it's like. It's like Star Trek, but even cheaper. Right, right. Uh, uh, I could get into the old Star I tried watching the old Star Trek. I actually didn't mind it. And plus, there's interesting present references to aliens that, that make you wonder if uh, what they knew at the time. So. Well, the the Doctor Who stuff predates the Star Trek stuff by yeah. quite a bit. So the technology, a lot of it, especially in the earlier days, is very cheesy stuff. Right. Uh, anyway... Uh, uh, I, it seems like we've reached the end of our road, but I'm <laughs> not wanting to uh, end it because, uh, yeah. you know, we, uh, you need to uh, kind of give me some direction. 
you went a lot of a lot of the stuff you glossed over and i don't mean to push you into getting more details of any given area no however, no please however um um you can at this point in our conversation you could literally go in just about any direction you wanted <laughs> and talk about anything that you feel would add uh uh richness to the conversation and i'm I'm okay with you going in just about any direction. As long as you feel comfortable and like to keep going, uh, I, at this point, I'm sort of lost on which direction to point you because <laughs> uh, you've gone over everything, but obviously um, you didn't go into a lot of detail in a lot of areas, but uh, it's, I feel like it's at a point in our conversation where I should allow you to go down any road that you feel is is most valuable for humanity to hear beyond you know you've told you've already enlightened people about the fact that their fears of the grays are a little bit blown out of proportion not a little bit but a lot blown out of proportion and the mantis and the grays are working together at least in the context of your encounters uh they're positive and um I hear people uh, talk about, you know, all the aliens being negative or evil or whatever, and I'm like, uh, there's basically an unlimited number. The, the the universe is unlimited in size and scope. It's infinite in every direction, and that's just one universe. And you know, if you don't don't even consider the multiverses, if you just consider this one universe, you have almost an unlimited number of alien races who, you know, you can't really say that each one of them has a, a particular agenda, good or bad or evil or positive or negative, because every individual within each one of those races is, has the, his own unique uh, desires and, and direction that he wants to go, or he or she wants to go in. And so uh, it's basically an unlimited number of possible scenarios where all these different races have their own agendas and are interacting with each other. So I guess if I did have a direction I could point you in, I don't know that I can even get you to go down that direction because I'm not sure you have information on that lines. But do you have you uh, come to any understanding through your experiences that go beyond uh, the grays and mantis that you're dealing with in, in order to give you, um, like, I'm going to give you an example. Okay, so if you talk to the uh, people like Len Buchanan and and um, the other remote viewers, they'll say, okay, well, there's the, the alien, there's a group of aliens who love us. There's a group of aliens that are ambivalent, uh, ambivalent about us. And there's the group of aliens that hate us. And then within each of these three groups, you got psychic and non-psychic, and it's basically split up in a very simplistic way into six different groups. And I'm sure that if you look at the actual what's happening, it could probably be split up into 5,000 different uh, pieces because you have 2,500 or more races in one universe that have that many different agendas and and I don't think any of them are pure evil or they wouldn't exist or the creator wouldn't allow them to continue to exist if they're absolute evil. But you hear about the reptilians and then you hear about a race that's supposed to scare even them. You know, they're supposed to be the big, bad, scary guys, but then there's other races. There's another race that's supposed to even scare those guys, the reptilians. And you're like, okay, so you try to wrap your mind around this larger picture. So without... Uh, making your eyes, you know, taking you into the uh, calling the deer headlight syndrome. Is there anything that you've come across in your life that that speaks about the larger picture beyond uh, what you've been shown directly by these two races? Interesting question. <clears throat> and um, I, well, no, I guess I would just say no. I haven't been shown anything, anything larger to give me any other greater context. And, well, I, and I, the lady, the lady, the lady, the, the 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 female alien that is the elder, that's the core of your story. The one right. of the two cores you have her, and you have the uh, 
the, the mantis that, that revealed himself. So you have two core individuals. Are there any other core individuals that you haven't mentioned? That no, no, there's, there's other peripheral aliens. Uh, did she yeah. did she ever give you a name of herself? Or uh, she, she doesn't have a name. So, so, uh, and I've, you know, most the other contactees I've met, this is, this is in fact the case. They, their, their telepathic nature, uh, they have telepathic signatures. And, uh, and so I've met other alien contactees and this is kind of how we, like, I think when they have names, they're giving that to humans. So, because they know humans use names, but um, the gray aliens, uh, in fact, they're just telepathic signatures. They're just an impression of what you know that that alien is and uh, and feels like and so if i'm saying that person's name i might it might translate into something the human words but it is not a, a name per se so i've always just called her the elder yeah. Yeah. well uh which direction would you like to go in this conversation <laughs> would you like to go is there any particular one of your 26 uh encounters or if you i'm going to add your 26 sure. you had eight as a child right uh, I actually haven't counted fully the child ones. So, uh, so what I mentioned, I mentioned, but here actually I do have an I, I do have a something I want to do want to say. Okay, um, go ahead. And, yeah, something I can add because for me, so there's this larger picture for this story about human nature and consciousness, and I think, and I always kind of say that that's what I think the beings are doing. There's well, okay, they're obviously doing a lot, but uh, and <clears throat> so for me, I had on the white room, I had. A God experience, what I call a God unification, unity experience with their crafts, nonetheless. So whatever they're able to do. And when you think about quantum tech and quantum computers, if this, like, you know, if unified field literally is underneath and one, we have the double slit experiment and observation seems to maybe affect reality. Uh, what is the field that that's able to occur in? You know, are we actually looking at a, you know, consciousness is pervading the universe. Is that what's going on here? And there are some people who are some scientists who are leaning towards this now that consciousness might be pervading the universe and then there's a field of consciousness underneath um and that's kind of why, where consciousness might be originating from anyway when, regardless i had this experience in the white room it manifests itself as the rising as this con this 20 year old kundalini rising thing that happened and then i end up with a guru a sad guru and they are the ones who are aware of that. They are the ones who, who, uh, and here's the thing. When I had my Kundalini rising, I got screwed up from it. <laughs> and it's almost kind of like they said, we want him to have this experience or you agree to have this experience. And then, you know, it changes your biology and you're going to learn from it from spiritually and whatever happens to you, you know, you'll be able to correct it with him. And, and it's true. I actually, over time, he helped me understand things. And, and so there's a, there's a picture here about, uh, well, what he ends up representing for me in my life is everything that, that happened to me, which is God is in every single one of us and uh, and really Godhood and really like finding the higher creator within and knowing that you are it. So in the Vedic process, they have the call Aham Brahmashmi, like I am God, I am the creator. And that interacts with visioning, which is what my side guru teaches is like how to how to manifest, you know, things from. You know, and you, and you have a, to create a central focus of will and can you physically affect the universe? And that's what he focuses on. And that's what the aliens, you know, when I left to go traveling, that's what that was all about, was the miracles that can occur while you travel. Uh, if you put yourself on the edge, does God actually exist and can miracles actually occur? And so there's a huge big picture being created about consciousness. And that's what I think there is a fundamental thing going on that the aliens really we're putting together in fact i mean i don't go into it at all but i have you know the telepathy that a lot of contactees can still have with their aliens i have that and, and that's that's the focus that's what they want and when it comes to things like paranormal activity and and even just dark a dark evil creature aliens when you know you're a god it changes out it changes the entire game and so uh you, you gain your power back actually is the way i frame it um, and these evil dark aliens stop being evil dark aliens and they end up really being uh, about a part of me and a part of it. And yeah, it might not like you. <laughs> that doesn't, but he, uh, humans don't like other humans too. Um, that's separate from saying it's just a dark thing and, and understanding it as a, as a uh, being that has its own sense of light. 
um, sometimes gets allows that thing to respect you and vice versa, you respect it and changes the whole playing field. And I think as a world, we're going to be moving into a dimensional room, a dimensional space. And I think this type of awareness that uh, God is in us all is actually how we gain our power uh, when we handle that dimensional space. Um, and and part of the thing of them getting, them giving me the higher self, like we talked about in the first contact event in the white room, when you feel your God, you're actually embodying your own higher self. And so there's a there's a whole wisdom, a whole science almost, if you will, about consciousness that's that that they kind of gave me that I feel like uh, part of my conversation is about uh, telling people that stuff. And I think um, it's a very f uh, powerful way to cap off uh, what they and people can't wrap their heads around it because they think that uh, God is a human construct. But I'm not convinced. I, uh, yes, there there is the the more the anthrop the anthropomorph the anthropomorph anthropomorphization of God is a human construct. The idea that it's a person who is you know morally judges you and all that garbage, a parent like person, uh, you know has to be eroded. But at the end of that, where is consciousness originating from? And are we actually dealing with a you know, unity underneath everything, that we actually are all the same and that we are all, even alien, alien human, it's actually just kind of a fundamental core energy that sits in the the base of all of us. And um, and if we were living from that, would we be living the way we're, would we be doing what we're doing now to the planet? So it feels like there's a larger picture here about consciousness and awareness. And uh, so that's, anyway, I like to throw that in there because I'm certain that's that's meant to be part of the picture, so. So your Kundalini rising experience was it before the White Room event, uh, in the White Room event, or after the White Room event? Yeah. So it happened in the White Room. Yeah, because they collapsed me as an orb, so they turned me into an orb, and then they replicated it. Twenty uh, four years later, as the consciousness event that this guy knows, the guy who didn't know he was having alien contact, and then it got replicated. And so it happened in 1997 is when it happened, the end of 1997. So how are you different? Uh, okay, so they they took your semen after you had the White Room event. It, it changed your uh, consciousness and your physicality and made your semen valuable. And But um, con in your head, your actual awareness, did it actually change? At the at the time that you became more valuable, and you've you've had this, you said it messed you up. Uh, <laughs> a, how did it mess you up? B, uh, is there any awareness difference in your head as a result of the white room? How did that all play out? Yeah, great, great questions. Okay, uh, but there's a couple of them, so I have to break things down here. Um, uh, just ask one of them, and so I can focus in on it. Uh, all of them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah i had the white room affect me so yeah that's we, good that's fine break it all down. that past life awareness that's what it all originates from because i saw uh in that pa in the white room when i was 16 years old i saw my uh, i saw the death of my last life so i saw so that feeling that the sensation of just even witnessing that is the sensation of of what i'm drawing drawing from uh, this kind of open, larger, expanded awareness. So it's the reason I have the Mark Anthony memories and have the past, the, the last life memories. It's the reason why I have all, I have all that whole big picture past life awareness. And uh, and yeah, so that's one of them. Uh, number two it does give me the, uh, let's say, the understanding of enlightenment. Not that I, not that I listen. Enlightenment is a process and it's a lifelong process. And uh, and it requires a control of the mind. So there is more to be said there, um, but it gives me understanding and also truth, the the science of it. And I think I've done a couple of videos now where I've really, you know, I think I just get see, I see people getting really confused about things in the, in the world, uh, especially when it comes to spirituality. So I really feel like uh, with a confidence I can speak to things, uh, and also understand when I see misinterpretation what's what is causing that misinterpretation. Um, and I think that's a helpful voice to, to have. And uh, and that's also in part, I gain it from having the Sadhguru who helps me translate these these really, uh, the kind of interdimensionality that's, that, that gets occurred from, from not being the body 
and 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 even exposing oneself to uh, what life might be like when you've died, um, there is a whole interdimensionality that exists there. And having even some kind of frame of reference or dialogue about it uh, is what the Vedic philosophy is. And uh, and and it's not a it's not it's not the Vedic philosophy is not. I need to make it clear. It's not a religion. It is a science about about the science of consciousness, and it's done a really good job at uh, at learning how to frame these high level con uh, concepts. And like bhakti yoga and and karma yoga, uh, people think that these are positions and they might you <laughs> the bendy positions, but really. Uh, their sciences of of the nature of consciousness, and that these guys who spent time in caves, you know, uh, over thousands of years, uh, really put down into practice, and and that's what Vedic philosophy is, and it's that's also something else here too. I think the aliens were really, um, like, I'm certain the aliens are looking for religions and spiritual practices that can bridge when they show up and they start exposing the world to this stuff. They need to be bridges. And, I, and that's what I feel I am too. I'm a bridge of a human ancient tradition, human ancient tradition that can blend itself with this crazy quantum computer interdimensionality stuff, paranormal, all that kind of, all big picture, putting it into one thing. Um, that's, that's, uh, did, that, did that even answer a question? I think I started just talking at that point. You did a great job. Okay, so. How did the white room mess you up? You'd say yeah, okay, well, yeah, mess me up, yeah. So, okay, not, okay. when I say, I really uh, I make the distinctions, the white room is the 16, when I was 16, my first year, white room, first contact event, 16 years old. The consciousness event, the consciousness experience, uh, the, the Kundalini rising, I am uh, 20 years old, and that's night, the end of 1997, four years later. So it's like they used the, the white room to, to, to model after. So when I would go through my Kundalini experience, I would, I guess my, my, I'd have a collapse. I'd have a natural collapse of energy in my body. I don't really fully know the details, but so how that messed me up is, um, and this is the Vedic, the Vedic stuff gave me this insight and over years of being with my guru. Um, the mind can't handle this stuff. It can't handle any, it can't handle the interdimensionality of what it, of what the consciousness really is. And uh, any of the interdimensionality can't be handled by the mind because the mind is literally three-dimensional. It's it's looking for, it's grasping all the time. It's grasping for reality. And I didn't have that awareness or understanding at the time. And it really is a, it can really make you mad, uh, make a person insane if you give them too much uh, spiritual awareness uh, when they're not ready for it. And that's, the crux of what happened to me. So I had this blissful experience. I had this rush, but then what happens to the mind of the 20 year old when he can't come back to it, when he changes his environment, he now I left and I got scared. So I'm terrified, scared. I'm living in a contradiction of experience. I'm living in the fear of not knowing what I'm doing with myself. Yet I had all this high. So then what happens is the gap becomes something that the person who is now terrified of his life because he's traveling and he's a hobo, he's reflecting back on the void of feeling. I felt all this uh, upliftment. What happened? How do I bring it back? And, and you get really screwed up in your head of the sensations of the different truthful. I knew that was real, but I couldn't replicate it again. And I couldn't figure out how to replicate it. But in the end, for anyone who understands these things, you don't replicate anything. You just have to learn how to let go of the mind from trying to rep understand that stuff and come back into the present moment experience. And But I didn't have any of that awareness at the time. And so I got really hung up on things and uh, also I didn't understand why I was doing what I was doing. And so I created a, a, basically a post-traumatic stress disorder uh, off of it. And I started shutting down things on the inside. I can't even, I tried to give it as much detail in the book so people could understand. It was just therapy for me to write the book in general, but uh, it, it, a PTSD got created that lasted for years. And so for those who you know want to maybe say graylings are bad, you can, someone can look at that event, but in the end, I do see it as big picture. And I do say like, well, yeah, but look why I got screwed up. <laughs> and I actually, it's because now that I've healed from all that, because I understand its origin, um, I have all the awareness of it. So it's, uh, it's really, do you, does that make sense? Like when you, when you were given these experiences, your brain, your brain is a tissued organism. 
And and you give that experience as it holds on to it. Now it defines it this certain way. You remove it. Now he's a terrified person living, struggling, traveling, doesn't know what is going on. And I'm grasping for it. I'm looking for the next thing that creates that. And because I was isolated traveling, I didn't know what was going on. I started I started creating like resistance to my higher self. I, that's what ended up happening. And it just it got it created a groove. It created a post-traumatic stress around it. And I couldn't relax on my ins. I couldn't relax in my heart. I had a full PTSD from it. I don't. Yeah, that's the best I can. Does that make sense? Well, OK, so when I had my first close encounter, um, uh, I thought I was hallucinating. I, the first thought in my head was uh, that this thing is a hallucination. It's not real. My mind is making it up. And I'm not going to go through that event because it would just take up time, which we don't have. But uh, the point is, I, the only point I want to make out of it is that I spent uh, six months with my mind, half of my mind saying it was real, another half of my mind saying it was a hallucination. And that conversation between the two halves of myself went on all day and night yes for six months yeah until yeah. i had my second encounter on cape canaveral before the first right. space shuttle launch and in that encounter you had hundreds of uh of nasa scientists and their families drive underneath a craft that was 30 foot off the road and you could have hit it with a rock and their minds were all made to where they didn't care because none of those cars stopped and uh, it was clear as day, and it's right over you. And but and the government uh, chose to cover that event up because it would be disclosure itself. Right. If all those people came forward, if hundreds of NASA scientists came forward and said, "Yeah, we saw this thing," that would be disclosure itself. And right. then there they don't. The government does not want disclosure, contrary to popular belief. Uh, so anyway, I just thought I would mention that uh, in reference to your how alien encounters can mess you up. I had to throw that in there just so people would have, uh, it's kind of backing you up. So um, did you, have you had any uh, encounters after meeting your current side guru? Yes, yeah, I did. So uh, so I met him in 2000, like my the whole traveling period is, it ends with this romantic meeting of my current wife, she was, a girlfriend at the time and she was already following him so well then I, when i left traveling i went to toronto to meet her and i i immediately meant to be like it was actually all kind of aligned the way it all happened and i i was uh with him right away actually and um i had a contact event so that was 2000 was the year 2000 october 2000 actually is when i met him i had a contact event uh the following year so like the spring uh 2001 uh, and so I didn't, nothing was said about him, um, but the big picture of my, of that period of my life up to that point made sense. Um, so, like kind of just, yeah, so did, have, has his assisting you with understanding your, uh, with, with trying to get a, a grip around your awareness and how to become a higher level human who's got a little more control over their focus and attention and energy yeah. is assisting you with that. Did that in any way uh, benefit you when you had that last encounter, the encounter? How many encounters have you had after meeting him so far? Yeah, um, four. Four. Yeah. So has, has your uh, movement forward with his assistance, did that assist you in any way? Uh, during those or be able to handle those four encounters better or did it assist you in any way with those four encounters that's a great question and yes yes it did yes it did so um now it's really weird right like the mind what happens to the brain here especially when you have you know there's a whole thing called the dual soul i actually really uh, susie hansen you know, uh, coined the word and it's uh, joel nyman seems to be the first abduction researcher who who understood that there's kind of a psyche split. There's like a two thing gets created. You have you have the contactee who has a whole world, and then you have the the human who has its own world. And it's a really fascinating psychology that goes on here. And so I created an identity in 2008 because I had 
got screwed up from the rising, this thing the aliens did with me, I created a whole identity around that, around rejecting myself. So I, uh, I was like a musician. I kind of like abandoned spirituality. I actually had a whole subconscious part of me that was like, I don't want to touch spirituality ever again. I really just didn't want to be into spirituality. I hate, I actually was dri driven against it and it was the subconscious resisting from the rising. And I knew all that. I was actually aware of that, but I couldn't figure out what to, how to heal the, the pain I was in. <clears throat> and, uh, and the pain is in part because it was actually in contact and the party knew that. But uh, when I had the, 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 the contact event in 2008, by that time, I actually, uh, looking back now, I can understand that um, he, my, my son, like just the teachings in general of meditating and, and, underst and being able to connect with your interdimensionally self. Yeah, you, you said it real, uh, really well. Like you, you can, you make your energy calmer and stable and more focused. Yeah, that's, that's just, the, that's the core of it really is, is to understand how to do that. Um, and uh, especially if you've been ex exposed to higher energy stuff, your, your brain will kind of have a way of, uh, you know, your brain will snap to things. And so you, it's kind of guidance on how, to, how not to do that or over time not to do that. And at that point in 2008, I'd actually gotten to a space where I'd, I could like touch the higher self, if you will, again. But I wasn't th clearly thinking that way at the time. And when I become the, the me that knows them, the, when I become aware of the contact event, or I become aware of the history while I'm in the contact event in 2008, um, there is an awareness of it. Yeah, you're like, oh, 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 and I could feel that I had some kind of, I could feel the change that was occurring in me and that it was something to do with, you know, I had removed myself over time from the insanity of the traveling period with the aliens and all the stuff that had happened to me with them. And, and then, yeah, there was a balance, a, a better balance is probably the way to frame that. Um, but again, it's, it's the achievement. All I'm gaining is the kind of steadiness of the awareness, the achievement of what I, the level that I got has never been achieved since. Uh, but you know, the truth about awareness is that you really do, uh, you can't bottle up awareness. So I'm able to, you know, draw from that awareness, but I, so that's what all this allows me to do. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess the way to frame that is I became more stable and I really like your wording behind that. It's pretty accurate actually. So you're saying that uh, being able to focus your mind and uh, your energy and, you know, daily or daily spiritual practice gave you some stability so that when you had your last four encounters, uh, that made it more uh, where you could handle those encounters better. So yeah, it, it's and the thing about what the guru is too, like right, I call it the transcendental mirror. Right? So when you're dealing with God and Godhood, um, the mind can't conceive God; it can't figure it out, and it has trouble. And I know this from the rising, from my own personal experience, that it can't handle god feelings as internalizing them at your god without having a mind that projects outwards and that's what the guru really is like that's why we choose to have like jesus krishna buddhas um gurus that were um, and we always externalize it right the brain is projecting all the time it's carl Jung that the brain is all constantly projecting and that's exactly what happens with like the kind of the god self and yet when you are able a guru when you're at, when you meet an enlightened individual the thing that he's doing is actually stabilizing your ability to hold on to God. It's actually, it's, and that's the key uh, feature of what a guru is actually doing is your, is hold is making it stable. So your brain has something to hold on to an image of the guru. And then you're internalizing the higher consciousness experiences you can get from either him or just yourself. Right. And um, so, but it's twisted because I also had a crazy history with aliens at that point. So uh, there was also a, once I became the me that knows them, I had a greater stability on the craft, uh, but it was also the history was there with them and all the other drama you could say. So it's uh, stability in the higher self. Yes, that's the, it's a great way. Well, you said something earlier that caught my attention that stuck in my head and that was the ability to um, uh, communicate with or hold on to your higher self. Now I've had my higher self speak through me Um uh, maybe once or twice in my entire life. Right. And so I know it exists. And also as a hypnotherapist, I've worked with the higher self and uh, with each of my clients, not all of them, but some of them. And so I understand it 
from dealing with it through clients and also speaking through me a couple times, once, twice. Uh, maybe you could speak a little bit about your direct experience with your higher self. Yeah, it's, it's the God self. I and mean, then that's awesome. I, I love uh, everybody who I, I get into this conversation with. They always reveal like, you know, they know it. They know it exists. They've spoke, it's spoken to them before. And I think I know most people uh, who are open enough uh, have a moment or two uh, in their lives where they were given clarity about their life, right? Um, uh, a stability when they felt like there was chaos and there's something saying, no, 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 like, you know, trust in, in something, trust in the universe or something. And so they're, they're needing to surrender. And uh, it's, it really is the higher self is the God, right? It is, it, it's the higher self is the, 